junkyard right up here. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> Let's stop hearing that for a second. There's a house here, and then there's another lane that goes back. Okay, so there's a house. Here. Here. Oh, my God, so bad. Okay, I didn't know about where. There was another one that I needed. What am I looking at? Well, it looked like the only the one with Ari on the front. I needed my trip. Great, thank you. You're so welcome. Anyway, Jerry, we ready? I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Right. Welcome, everyone, uh, to this uh, Committee of the Whole, which is a meeting of the Shippensburg Area School District School Board. Um, we uh, have uh, two items on our agenda tonight. First, we have a presentation from uh, James Bird Elementary School, uh, and then uh, and then we have uh, a budget budget updates later on. So. Uh, Mr. Floor, uh, I believe uh, it's uh, your presentation. Well, partially mine, more Mrs. Wallace, Ms. Wallace. So um, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be here tonight to share with you. Um, we wanted to highlight at James Bird some of the amazing things that our staff are doing for our students. I'm going to interrupt real quick, and I may not have been setting a very good example, but if you could just really speak into the microphone, especially for those who are uh, listening via YouTube. They can't hear very well if we're not speaking directly in the microphone. Thank you. Is that better? It's awesome. Um, and so we wanted to highlight some of the things that our amazing staff and students are doing for our special ed population. So I asked Ms. Wallow and Mrs. Sergi to work together to um, present some information to show a little bit more about our ABA program, um, and I'll let her go into some more detail about that, but it's a, a fabulous program for those of you who had the opportunity to come and visit our school to see these kids. Um, it's amazing what they have done and been able to accomplish with the support of those teachers and the classroom assistants that are there. And without further ado, I'll let Ms. Wallow go ahead and get started. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Super. All right, good evening, Shippensburg School Board. My name is Amy Wallow, and I'm here to talk to you about the ABA program at James Bird. I was invited here to share this information with you by Mr. Matthew Floor, and I created this presentation with the other ABA teacher, Mrs. Danielle Sergi. Unfortunately, she's unable to be here uh, this evening, but she was a co-contributor in creating this presentation and has allowed me to present her parts on her behalf. So without further ado, here we go. All right, to begin, I want to give you some information on our background. So I'll first I'll tell you about Mrs. Danielle Sergi. She got her Bachelor's of Science in Elementary and Special Education from East Stroudsburg University. She holds a Master's in Education from Wilson College. She also holds an Administrative Certification in Special, an Administrative Certification from Shippensburg University. And she's been serving students with special needs for 10 years. I hold my Bachelor's in Science in Elementary and Special Education from Towson University. I also hold my Master's in Special Education from Wilson College and I've been serving students with special needs for six years. So first to begin, we're gonna define what ABA is. And ABA stands for Applied Behavior Analysis. And what that is, is it's the science of studying behaviors. And we apply that data to supported techniques to increase and decrease behaviors that are meaningful to the individuals in their social environment. So we wanna increase positive behaviors and decrease problem or negative behaviors from our students. Why do we use ABA? And to put it to start it off, we want to analyze socially significant behaviors that are in need of improvement. And this means that our behavior analysts, we have two for the district, Mrs. Nicole Showers and Mrs. Brianne Bream, and the teachers, collect, examine, and interpret data as part of the teaching process. Um, behavior is defined in objective and measurable terms, and we examine the functional relationship behavior, what a person does and what's happening in the environment. And one of the terms we use very often is ABC data, which we talk about in the three-term contingency, which is what happens before a behavior, what is the behavior, and what happens after the behavior. An example would be if a student is denied access to something or told no. That is their antecedent. Their behavior may be screaming, crying, throwing themselves on the floor. That's the behavior they chose to do in response to what happened to their environment. What happens after is a consequence. Consequences can be positive or negative. Maybe the person gives them what they're looking for. 
that would be a positive consequence. Now, if I throw myself on the floor and scream, you give me what I want. Or if I throw myself on the floor and I'm denied access and still don't get that item, then I learn that that behavior isn't going to get me what I need in my environment. A really important part of ABA is verbal behavior. You'll hear this term on and on again when you come into the classroom. And verbal behavior is a method of teaching language that focuses on the ideas that a meaning of a word is found in its functions. And this is a term that was coined by B.F. Skinner. If you've taken any psychology classes in college, you've heard that name time and time again. But in order to teach a child that already has language delays what a word means, we have to teach it in a functional way. For an example, instead of just teaching a word, we have to use we have to teach them how to use that word in context. <clears throat> Why do we use language? ABA focuses on the functional analysis of language. So what are the conditions under which a person uses language? In other words, why are we talking? Verbal behavior can include speaking, using sign language, writing, gesturing, picture exchange systems, or various augmentative communication devices. If you were to come into mine or Mrs. Sergi's classroom, you would see students using all, com all combinations of those. We have students that use sign language, we have students that use the picture exchange system, and I currently have three students that use augmentative communication devices. Those are just some examples in picture form. I recorded a video of one of my students using an augmentative communication device, and this student is only an AAC user. They don't have any vo vocal ability. They only communicate via sign language or this device. And in this example, she is trying to answer a question at our morning calendar. And if you can tell on the front of her device, there's a bit of a grid, and that helps her finger touch the appropriate button. Because you can imagine the frustration she must have if she tries to click something, but her fine motor strength isn't strong enough, and she keeps clicking the wrong buttons. That's a huge barrier to her asking for a cookie when I can just verbally ask you for one. So by having that grid on there, it gives her a better ability to touch what she needs and get to her ability to answer quicker. Go ahead. Giselle, what month is it? It. Yep, is it. March. Look at it. It is March. So, by having her use her augmentative communication device, she's able to answer the calendar question, which is, What is the month? And you might have been able to hear in the background some of the other devices that were also answering the question at the same time. Giselle, what month? This is another example of how the AAC can be used in class. This student has an AAC, but they also have vocal ability. And they are much quicker at picking up on uh, how to use the device than other kids. And he's very quick to answer his question as well. <laughs> Landon, what is this? It is a sand. For the record, I showed him how to do that one time, and then he just absolutely knew how to do it from there. He is a rock star with his device. <laughs> I just love hearing his little laugh in the background. <laughs> a next really important part of ABA is the verbal operants. This is something you may not have heard before, but I've tried to put it in as super easy terms as possible so I don't get super sciency. But verbal behavior is best understood by learning these verbal operants. And the verbal operants are a way of classifying what is being said and why it is said. So the first one is manding. And manding is just a fancy word for requesting. You say it because you want it. If I walked into a grocery store and walked up to the counter and said chocolate chip cookie, the likelihood of me getting a chocolate chip cookie is high because I've said what I need. Is it the most socially appropriate way? No. But we're getting the idea of how to request what they want. The next is tacting, which is a, another word for labeling. You say it because you either see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, or feel something. So that's another way that we teach language. The next is echoic. It's simply just repeating back what someone says. You say it because someone else said it. When a student has a significant language delay, if they're just learning how to use their voice, sometimes it's really good to start helping them practice use it by just simply echoing back words to you. Another verbal operant is intraverbals, which helps them learn how to have conversations, answer questions, and respond when someone else is talking to them. Intraverbals are, you say it because someone else has asked you a question or made a comment. Imitation is repeating someone else's motor behavior. You move because someone else moved that way. And I'll give you an example of kind of how we teach that in the classroom in a minute. 
And the final verbal operant is listener responding, and that is just simply following directions. You do what someone asks you to do because that's what they said. It can be a lot all at once, so I thought I would show you how we use that by teaching all the meanings of the word cookie. This might sound silly, but it's something that you have to do with children with autism or multiple disabilities because they haven't been explicitly taught that. If you think about it, way back when, when you were little, someone taught you all these things about words. But the first one is a coic. So if I'm teaching a student how to use the word cookie, if I say cookie, they repeat it back. If I have one in my hand, I might say cookie. They say cookie, they get the cookie. They understand that using their voice and saying that word produces them that item. The next one is introverbal. When someone asks a question or makes a comment, then they could use that as an answer, as in, what do you like to eat? The appropriate response could be cookie. Next would be motor imitation. If I used sign language because I didn't have the vocal ability, if I went like this, and that's the sign for cookie, if I looked at my teacher and went like this, I say, yeah, that is the sign for cookie, here you go. And they got the same response that they did from other verbal operants. Manding, that's simply as if they're just sitting in class and if they say cookie, the likelihood is, I'll probably give them one, because they use their voice to advocate for what they wanted. Next is tacting, so if I was holding up an actual cookie, showing a picture, if we were in the environment somewhere else and I said, what is this? Their response could be, cookie. And finally is listener response, when they respond to someone else giving an instruction, if we're working at the table, I could say, touch the cookie, give me cookie, those would be ways in which they'd hear what I'm asking and then th they would get a cookie or touch it based on listening to what they were asked to do. All right, the main type of assessment that we use in ABA is called the VB MAP, and that stands for the B Verbal Behavioral Milestone Assessment Placement Program. Quite a mouthful. <laughs> but it's actually a fantastic assessment because very few assessments actually exist that assess the acquisitions of verbal operants, which is what we're trying to look at with these students. The efficiency of the assessment is that it's super easy to give and it's not time consuming. This does not require the teacher to go into a separate room, set up a bunch of materials and sit very promptly at a desk and have the student answer. This allows me to just put it on a clipboard and we could be playing on the floor and I could be going through questions. We could be walking in the hallway, outside on the playground, and we could be answering the questions. So the assessment allows us to be able to assess the students in the most natural environment and not put them in under any pretenses that make them feel nervous or unable to perform. It's linked to typical developing uh, children. It allows for more detailed analysis of skill sets at the operant level. And the components can assist in troubleshooting instruction. So when we look at the assessment, we can see that a child may need help in a particular operant, and that's where we focus our instruction on. What I think is really important for you guys to see is the typical cognitive level that we're working with with our students. In our classroom, we're maxed out at eight. So between Mrs. Sergi and myself, the max number of children we can have is 16 between the two of us. And based on where the students place on the VB map, they are placing at the earliest of zero months and at the oldest about 48 months. So that's where we're cognitively functioning. The chronological age of the child and their cognitive functioning level are not always the same, which is why we have these classrooms in order to give these children that need a lot more help who otherwise could be placed out of district and need a different classroom, they get the opportunity to stay in their hometown and get access to the content that they get. So if a student is scoring in a level one range, they're typically cognitively functioning at a zero to 18 month. And as you can see, it just kind of goes up from there. There. And these developmental levels are determined by samples of neurotypical children and comparing that with our neurodiverse students. This is an example of um, a graph that I made just recently for one of my students, and I'm very proud of this one because red is where the student started. This was his first year of school, and the entire graph is blank in the beginning of the year except for those red portions. So red is what he came in with. And if we're looking back at those levels from the previous slide, he's just as an early level one. So he's functioning at cognitively zero to 18 months. And this is his first year of school. By the end of the year, the blue and the red are everything that he has now. So as you can tell, he has soared. And I could not be happier with how much he's grown. And that just shows that the program was so beneficial to him. He came in with very few skills. And now he's able to request things. He's able to label things. He's able to listen to questions we ask. And he's able to complete those requests. His social behavior and play behavior have gone up. He's actually playing with kids on the playground. And they're playing with him. And they're having a great time. And I can't tell you how much it warms my heart. So this is just one of the ways that we're able to display the information to show parents, look how much your child is growing. This is amazing. 
Why do we need the ABA program? Simply put, it's critical to consider this analysis when developing language programs for individuals with autism. This allows teaching what to say as well as when to say it. For example, it's important for students to learn to use language under the right conditions, such as saying water when they're thirsty or they want, it, want water versus just saying it because they see it or hear you say it. So now's the fun part, which is videos. So this first one is manding sessions, which we talked about beginning is requesting. And when a child isn't verbally producing words to you, when they're able to finally say what they want to you, it is huge. So this first video, unfortunately, the other video is not giving us access because technology, right? But this first video is of a student who came in only really manding for objects and food. And then we kind of wanted to generate motivation for social interaction. We wanted to find things that he wanted to do which required an adult to perform that action, whether it be running, skipping, jumping, spinning. And in this instance, it's spinning on the swing. Go ahead, Mrs. Waddle. <laughs> Ready, <laughs> set, go. Go, big spin! <laughs> Can you pause it, Mrs. Woodall? Okay. Okay. I don't know about you, but I could listen to that laugh all day long. So he was using interverbal responses. Ready, set, go. And the go is what cued him for me to, put, to do a spin. Later in the video, I start using the word spin. If he tells me the word spin, I'll spin him. And if he does it all by himself without me giving any sort of prompting, then I'd spin him even harder. Personally, I couldn't spin like that. I'd be super dizzy, but he loves it. The other video, which you can't see, is just another student who came in with no vocal manding whatsoever. And in that video, she's requesting to read her book, asking for pretzels, and to play a video on the um, TA's phone to pair with it, the book she's reading. Okay. ITT sessions are kind of the cornerstone of what we do with our students. And these programs are individually made for each student. So those cards on the table, every card was hand cut by our staff and made specifically for that child. So every single program is tailored to exactly what they need to focus on their language development. And this particular student, um, you're going to see in the video, he entered into the classroom with extremely limited vocal abilities. His vocal output was mostly in the form of echoing back whatever we said and basic wants and needs. Within his program, everything is centered around vocal language by building imitation skills and sign language. So what you're going to see is a lot of vocal approximations paired with sign language. And Mrs. Sergi is the instructor in this video. Number? Two. Yes, two. What are those? Books. Good job. They are books. I love how you signed it. What letter? M. Yes, M. What letter? G. Yes, G. Put on. Spin. Good job spinning. Ready, set. put the block on the block. Great work. I think we could say we could spend the rest of the night just watching him, right? He's precious. So that was a really beautiful example for Mrs. Sergi on how our content looks. It's very positive. It's very easygoing and happy. He's getting lots of treats. He's getting lots of praise and he's learning at the same time. This is one of my students, and same example in a sense where it, she came into the program with very limited vocal language, and she actually primarily uses an AAC device in sign language. She began in the program working on increasing her sign language skills to aid in her vocal communication, and since starting, she's greatly improved her vocal responding accompanied with sign language. So again, we're gonna see a lot of vocal approximations paired with sign. Ready? Two. Good job saying two. What's this? 
dog. It is a dog. Good job signing dog. Do this. Ball. That's the sign for ball. What color? Black. Black. Good job signing black. You yeah. did it. I'm so proud of you. Here's popcorn. Nice working. You're doing so good. Ready? Do this. That's the sign for bed. Nice work. What is it? Good job signing fork. You got it. Do this. Good job knocking. What's this? So it is so beautiful. Nice job. Do this. That's the sign for bird. You got it. What's this? Cracker. Cracker. You got it. Good job signing cracker. I love that. Do this. That's how you put on. You got it. What's this? Good job signing bus. That was great. High five. You can have a cookie. Nice work. Okay, we're going to do a tricky one. Ready? What is it? Lamp. Oh, good. What is it? Yeah, it is a lamp. Do this. Do this. What is it? It is a lamp. High five, Dickles. Good job. So we have a lot of fun at work. <laughs> All right, to conclude the presentation, something that Mrs. Sergi and I really wanted to include was some of the feedback that our families have about the program and how they feel. So we had sent out some information to our families and said, what are your feelings about the ABA program and what would you like to share with the board this evening? So the first one is from a parent named Angelise S. She says, since my student started school, he's been very vocal and repetitive. He's not afraid of trying to say new words. His social skills improved and he learned to play and share with peers. He's, learned, uh, he's following directions more often than before and responds when spoken to rather than usually ignoring while acting uninterested. All of his motor skills have improved as well. He takes initiative on tasks and has learned routines. He's learned to sign some words and use sign language on a regular basis. We're very pleased with his progress. Next is some written input from the Swisher family. Tensions and feelings were high going into August of 2022. After a lot of research and a district-provided session on the ABA classroom, we were finding ourselves at arm's lengths regarding the procedures of ABA, but open-minded. I can't say enough about how open, warm, welcoming, and available and consistent the team has been from even the onset of transitioning from preschool to the current. They have only increased my trust and confidence in both their professional abilities to educate my child, but more importantly, their apparent care and love for our daughter. I don't know why we would have ever had any doubts. Even, though the challenging, even through the challenging moments for her and her team, she has continued to progress and learn how to use her voice. Everything is in her time. The classroom has assisted her with the most helpful tools and come alongside her to help her grow while providing a structured classroom schedule. Her vocabulary has continued to flourish and take flight. Her kindergarten year has given us hope for her future and has assured us of what she is capable of when the right people are in her corner, and she's in a place that values her individually and understands her competence when it comes to education. With gratitude, the Swishers. Next is from a parent, Nancy S. Yes. Their student has been more vocal in trying to sound out words. She uses sign language more. She loves school and her friends and teachers. She's been able to better communicate her wants and needs and doesn't get as frustrated. This next one's a long one, sorry. This is from Mrs. Bethany S. Our son has been in the ABA program for almost two years now, kindergarten and first grade. The ABA team includes his teachers, support staff, speech and occupational therapists, behavior analysts, program directors, and many others who have worked co cohesively to provide the resources needed for his growth. The program and interventions are explained well, and the team uses daily communication logs, IEP meetings, and progress reports to keep the families involved and be able to take an active role in their child's education. I recently read an article called A New Understanding by Lisa Jo Ruby, stating in part that when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Every autistic person has a different set of strengths and needs. While there's no single right answer for how to support an autistic person, there are many good ones. The ABA program has utilized an individualistic approach in fulfilling those aspects. They took the time to build a relationship with him, and because of that, he has fostered an understanding for, they fostered an understanding for him that engaging in learning can be positive. He has the opportunity to explore social interactions in a comfortable and safe environment with extremely supportive staff by his side. He experiences a lot of emotions as he learns new things in the program. His teachers are always monitoring his level of emotion, thus being able to keep the learning experience positive. Because of that, he's able to learn and express himself in new and broader ways. We can see his academic progress because of the activities used in the program, and he's able to better express his knowledge and abilities because of those opportunities. 
He has many sensory needs, and the program and staff support those needs so they don't become a barrier to his learning. We're so appreciative and grateful for his ABA team at James Byrd and our school district for bringing this type of program close to home for so many families that require this type of educational environment to set up their child for a lifetime of success. Next is a parent feedback from Richard and Layla. When our students started, he could not talk much and had trouble communicating and has come a long way since then. His communication has gotten a lot better since then where now you can understand him and also he, he can use sign language to help us understand. He uses sign language to say he's hungry, needs help, wants more, and he can sign the whole alphabet and knows how to read books. He's also tracing a lot of things which he could not have done before. The ABA teachers have helped a lot when it comes to his education and other needs. I could not have asked for a better program that would benefit him more than the ABA classroom and teachers. Final submission, this family recorded. They might look familiar, Ted Dewald and Melissa. Uh, Melissa hello, Dewald. Shippensburg. Uh, you're School good. board members, administrators, and community. I'm Ted Dewald. And I'm Melinda Dewald, and we are Ian's parents. We wanted to say a little bit about our experience with our son, Ian, in the ABA classroom. Um, to be honest, we were skeptics at first. We're both classroom teachers, and we had never heard of any instruction like this before. Um, but we were fortunate enough to attend a training by the district for parents, and we were totally convinced of the program's efficacy. And over the past year, we've seen Ian's growth uh, in our own home, which convinces us all the more. At home, he's been communicating more and more regularly. He's been specifically asking for things that he would like. He's been naming objects, which may not <coughs> seem like that big of a deal, but it is a giant deal if a kid isn't doing that. He is seven, he is cute as can be, but it is way more helpful um, if he is communicating his needs and his wants to us, and even when he doesn't want to do something. And he's just, we've seen tremendous growth with, in that regard. Um, before, what we would often see is him not actually engaging verbally or with sign, except for some of his most basic needs. Or he would just repeat some of the words that, that we would say to him. He would just kind of echo back. And what we're seeing now is that he's actually initiating his own thoughts more and more often. He's engaging with uh, the world around him independently uh, more and more every day. We are incredibly thankful for his teacher, for his aide, for all of the aides in his classroom. Um, and we just can't say enough good things about James Bird. We know how lucky we are that he is in such a good classroom. With every kid, it takes a village to help them to grow. And with Ian, we see that all the more and are just so thankful that he is in this classroom. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak tonight. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right, before I open up, if you guys have any questions, I want to extend the offer from Mrs. Sergi and myself that we are more than happy to host you to come in the classroom whenever you'd like. In the beginning of the school year, I know the board was given an opportunity to tour some of the special education facilities, and I know Mrs. Wolfinger and Mrs. Everly were there, so thank you. Um, but I know that it's not always conducive to everyone's schedule, and we are more than flexible. So if you ever are in the area and you want to come by, we are more than happy to host you. You can contact myself, Mrs. Sergi, or Mr. Floor, and you'd be more than would be more than happy to have you come and observe. Uh, thank you for giving me the time to speak this evening. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, have a great evening. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Floor, Ms. Wallow. I, I, just a couple comments quickly. You know, I think this presentation talks about the gamut of services that we offer as a district, um, the importance, uh, the expertise of our staff and the dedication of our teachers. Um, and, and most importantly, I think that, that all students can grow and learn. Um, and, you know, so appreciate your time tonight, uh, both of you. Thank you. We're going to turn it over to Mrs. Lentz for some budget updates, which may not be as uplifting as the last presentation. <laughs> All right, so this evening, we're actually gon gonna review the special education budget, which kind of ties into the presentation uh, that you just saw uh, this evening, as well as review um, the personnel requests for the 23-24 budget year, and then to look at the updated summary of revenue and expenditures. 
So we're going to begin this evening and we're going to look at the special education budget. So in the first column, you can see what we budgeted for the 22-23 school year. So we currently have the special education budget sitting at about 2.7 million. However, during the current school year, we have seen an increase in the number of our special education students. So we believe that we are probably going to exceed um, what we had originally budgeted for in 22-23. <laughs> And we also, as well, did not per, um, budget any contingencies in the 22-23 school year, and we have seen a lot of move-ins and new placements that occurred um, in the current school year. So then the next column over is the 23-24 budget that we had put in for the preliminary budget. So we put in special education costs at about $3.67 million. And then based on the newest information available to us at this point, we have revised the 23-24 budget, so we have that now projected at about 3.77 million. So from the preliminary budget to the revised budget, we added about additional 96,000. <coughs> However, the difference column that you see there of, a, of over $1 million increase, that is the difference between the 22-23 budget and the revised 23-24 budget. So you can see, um, just to quickly highlight, those cost differences where the, the big cost differences are are in our 300 categories, which are services that we receive through the IU. Uh, they have increased um, over the 22-23 budget year, as well as our 500 category um, has increased almost 700,000, and that's placements um, to other vendors that are not um, IU connected. So. Um, placements such as Yellow Breaches, River Rock, um, the SOAR program are just to name a few. Um, so I, again, I just wanted to point out that uh, in the 22-23 budget, we had no contingencies. However, going forward, um, we think it's financially responsible um, for us to budget contingencies moving forward so we don't see such a big jump from one budget year to the, to the next. So currently, uh, we have a total of six contingencies or open slots um, in our 23-24 budget. I will stop there and ask if there's any questions regarding the special education budget. We actually have some more to present regarding special ed, but is there any questions regarding this slide? So when you say open slots, you mean for incoming students who aren't presently enrolled in special education programs? Is that what you, that what you mean? Okay, thank you. It's a more realistic budget. You know, in, instead of coming and saying we need this placement, um, you know, we hopefully will have, have baked that into the budget process. So for the um, upcoming school year, you'll see this on the personnel request list. Um, down at the bottom, I'm gonna start at the bottom and kind of more work my way up. Um, the proposed reallocation, we are asking the board to consider hiring an additional registered behavior technician. Currently, uh, we have one of those positions in our district, as well as to hire a star teacher at our intermediate school. And what that will do is that will allow us to build internal capacities, as well as potentially mitigate any additional outside placements. Um, I will say, though, if the board would decide not to um, hire these two positions, then unfortunately, the budget that you had just, that I had just presented to you, we are going to have to add additional <coughs> costs to those. Um, as you can see there, we have uh, three um, students that will need to be placed outside the district if we are unable to get a star teacher at our intermediate school. And then um, we are actually um, receiving in revenue um, from uh, for consortium students that are placed in our district. So between the revenue that we would get in um, for these students staying 
um, in our district and us educating them from a different district, as well as not placing these uh, three students outside the district, we actually have a small cost avoidance of $7,418. So again, if um, we do not hire these um, two positions for the district, we will have to then turn around and add in the outside placements into the, the budget that you have, you have just seen. So either way, we're going to add to the budget. It's do we want to add more to the budget, which would be to place these students out, or hire these two positions and one kind of avoid um, about $7,418 and allow us to build internal capacities and possibly mitigate additional outside placements. So it would give us some wiggle room. So again, um, based on that, we are asking the board to highly consider um, hiring these two positions. And just to be clear, the registered behavior technician would not just serve the intermediate school. They would serve um, district-wide, both special education and regular education students. It's critical we have capacity within our buildings to meet the students that the needs that we have. Um, and, and that's where we have the most cost savings um, to the district is when we don't have to use an outside placement. Um, so building, building a structure where we can keep them here um, is beneficial. Um, you know, Ms. Mrs. Zima in, in Franklin County schools um, are looking to grow a consortium model um, where we can reduce costs for outside placements by sharing spots within, you know, programs that, that um, are unique enough that, that we can send our kids and, and take kids and have it be um, cost neutral uh, at the end of the day, hopefully. Um, so, uh, again, a realistic approach uh, for us to, to meet our kids' needs without sending them out of district. Okay, so that brings us to our personnel request list. Um, I am not going to go over the entire list this evening of the various requests, but I wanted to point out attached to agenda manager is the full list of personnel requests that we received um, from our building principals and from our department heads. And if you take a look at that list, you'll see that it's very clear that we have great needs across um, all levels in our district. However, uh, <coughs> I guess Mrs. Woodall and I have met to review uh, the entire personnel list and pare it down to a priority list. Um, board members, you have the list in front of you. It is a page and a half long of the total personnel list. Uh, the slide that you, you see in front of you um, is, again, the priority one list. And we have it broken down into a must-have priority one and then other priority one request. So just to begin at the top, you'll see in red, we, I have listed the middle school teachers. Um, for the 23-24 school year, we are hiring uh, four new seventh grade middle <coughs> school teaching positions to fill the new classrooms. Uh, that $400,000 is not in any of the totals that you see below. It is just a reminder to keep it at the forefront that we must continue to de develop future budgets to be able to absorb those <coughs> um, four seventh grade middle school teachers into our budget. If you recall, um, Mr. Burt had made a motion to set a million dollars aside of fund balance to help ease these positions into the budget with 23-24 being the first year and we would fully fund all four positions out of fund balance. The following year we would fund three teachers, the following year two, and then the following year one, and by then that um, fourth or fifth year we would need to absorb the whole cost into our budget. So just keep that at your forefront when we're developing budgets that we must absorb those into our budget. So that begins with um, number one, um, our must-have priority list. It was the star teacher at the intermediate school and the registered behavior technician um, that we just spoke about. So in column one shows if we are able to provide those services in-house, the additional cost to the district would be $160,017. Uh, However, if uh, we do not hire these two positions and we need to send these students outside the district, it's going to cost us $167,435 or an additional $7,418 to the district. We are also in need of a, an additional ESL or English as a second language teacher full time at either um, Bird or Grayson, 
split between Bird Grayson or Intermediate School and Bird. Um, that's still to be worked out. Um, the in-house cost for that person is just under $100,000. If we do not hire our own ESL teacher, we're going to have to contract out for those services, and that's going to be approximately $140,000. So that's going to add an additional $40,000 to the budget um, if we decide to contract out. And then uh, we are also in need of a first grade teacher at Nancy Grayson and a second grade teacher at James <coughs> Bird uh, for next school year based on just our current enrollment. Uh, the class sizes um, are fairly high. I don't know if um, Mr. August or Mrs. Wood I want to talk about that, but I'll just stop here for a moment and say um, for two teaching positions, that's just under $200,000. Um, we will have uh, Title II revenue uh, that we can use towards um, these positions. So that brings the cost down to the district of just uh, about $160,000. So the, the kindergarten, we currently have tw 12 classes? So we currently have 12 classes in kindergarten, 11 in first grade. If you look at both buildings of Berg and Grayson, each one of them have similar numbers of kindergartners moving up in the first grade. Bird currently has six first grade teachers. Grayson only has five. If we don't get the first grade teacher at Grayson, they'll start off with class sizes in, or in first grade of about 27, 28, which I don't know how many of you have ever been in a first grade classroom, but that is way too many for a first grade classroom. Um, we put them as a packaged deal because Bird's first grade right now is very, very large. and our packaged deal basically if we don't get the first grade teacher at Grayson the first grade teacher at Bird would be a bubble teacher and move up to second grade to reduce those class sizes we couldn't keep that first grade teacher at Bird in first grade and not hire one at Grayson because then Bird would have six teachers to teach the same number of students as Grayson would have <coughs> teachers if that makes sense right now Bird has a larger bubble in first grade Grayson does. So, so uh, obviously, there's top nine. Uh, you know, we, we wrestled with which ones to put forward, um, knowing that class size is important to the the board. Um, we moved those positions up. You know, so so moving into you know going from twelve to eleven, um, going from six to five classrooms, especially at that early de de developmental level. Um, is a challenge. I mean, there are other districts that have those high class size numbers, um, but that's just based on what we have now. Um, that's not including, you know, potential move-ins or, you know, additional students. Um, so, so it can get very ugly very quickly, um, you know, without the extra support. What classroom, where, where are they going to go? So we have talked about that with Mr. Eastman, and it would be, it would end up being counseling, and I believe health would be not in their classroom that they're currently in. So I thought that the guidance it? was already on a yes. cart, um, especially even, I think it's Bird, I know. I know Bird, is. Bird's counselor is on a cart, and I believe, is Mr. Floor still here? <laughs> if you want to come up and I know we've discussed a couple options for second grade over at Bird. Sure. So right now for our counselor, um, we're utilizing, um, we share specialists across um, between different buildings. And so our guidance classroom is in a different room depending on um, the cycle day. So one of the cycle days we don't have art. She's in the art room giving her guidance lessons um, for, um, for, kinder, for first, second, and third grade. It's just easier for kindergarten if we push into those rooms. She could still do her lesson in, kindergarten, in those spaces, but just kindergartners traveling in the hallways, end of the day, it's a little, a little chaotic. Um, but moving forward, we would look at um, taking some of those spaces with one of our specialists and potentially having them push into classrooms or trying to figure out with where our special schedule, if there was any space to have them um, move into that classroom and put those specialists on a cart. Where, so where would the second grade classroom go? Like that additional classroom, mm -hmm. like the actual. And 
that would be, we would have to get a little creative in terms of looking at the spaces that we currently use and see if there were any of, whether it's, um, you know, special, like a reading specialist. We have a room that's a split room that they're sharing and maybe we combine that and have them, you know, push into a different space. And the dominoes would kind of fall from there depending upon um, what we would want to do at that point. But initially it would just be trying to find, identify a space and then move people around accordingly. So are we, are we not considering the removing pre-K? So they're here for another year. Okay. So, I mean, it could be a temporary problem until, you know, we, that contract ends. If, if excuse me, even with the other pre-K, how much more? Do you need classrooms? Yes. How many more you need? Um, to accommodate our class sizes right now, we would just need one additional for that second grade. So we need to find a way to get, a, get you an additional room, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Scott, we have that plan. You know, it's it's down the line. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm, that's what I'm it. We, we have to we have to get there. Get the, well, that, that's my point. We got a plan down the line. I wonder what going to That's like five years from now. Yeah, we're going to get some action down the line. I mean, they're, they're, we, our kids are crammed in there, oversized. We have to make some adjustments. So, absolutely. I mean, the, the hardest part is going to be getting the teachers <laughs> in the budget. Um, yeah, we may have to be, as Mr. Floor says, be creative for, you know, a, a, a certain amount of time until we can free up some space, um, you know, with, with pre-K. You know, it's, it's not my... It's not my goal to kick out pre-K, um, you know, but, but the first priority is reducing class size numbers, in my mind. Um, you know, we, we can put specialists on carts, we can, we can reconfigure things, that's doable. Um, it's not the, the best um, until the facility part can catch up. I'm just thinking that the specialist rooms, like they're not full-sized classrooms. So, I mean, even if you put them on carts, you still don't have a classroom, I guess is what I'm... Mr. Floor, can you speak to that? I mean, I guess this is, my, my concern is the timeline that we've created for when we're going to address the two elementary schools, classroom additions. We've kicked them the furthest down the road, but in my mind, and from all of the data that we've been presented time and time again, they're the most urgent need as far as classrooms go. Well, and we, we do have that safety valve of the pre-K classrooms, so that does buy us some time. Um, yeah, so once once that runs its course, you know, those spaces free up. Uh, but uh, we're growing, correct? The school district's growing. S slowly growing over the next decade. That's uh, a year ago, I heard, I, heard, I heard we were not growing at all. Now it's growing over the next decade. <laughs> My question is, if, if they need classrooms, our teachers over aside, we need teachers, what is the plan for now? I mean, I mean, other than... The so we, we believe we can make this work, Mr. Floor, correct? So not, not as ideal as we would like it. Um, the, you know, the next phase would then be to look at those pre-K classrooms. Those pre-K classrooms would... would you know, when we re if and when we reclaim them, would would give us the necessary space in the buildings pretty comfortably. And and that you know, we, we, un unfortunately, we have too many needs, um, and we we have to take these at and chunk our solutions. So step one is the, you know the decision point is do we want to reduce class sizes? I mean, to to your point, we can either hire these teachers and find a space in the building and reduce class size numbers or not hire the teachers and have higher class sizes in the rooms that we have. They're, they're interlocked problems. Um, we'd love to do both right now. Um, unfortunately, we have to make a decision on which path to take first. Um, you know, and, and, and in talking with Sherry um, and, and Christy, we, we think folding these um, teachers into our budget is, is the, the right first step for this. Um, because we know we can get that space from, from pre-K if we need, which would solve many problems. Okay. Oh. The room with the specialist, Mr. Floor, is it a, it's a smaller room, correct? If the, 
if you're looking at like the reading specialist, it's a full size classroom that has a divider through the middle. So if we would take that divider out, it would still be a full size classroom with all the same technologies that every other classroom would have. What is, I know we're strapped for money and everything. What about a, uh, those modular buildings, modular classrooms? So <laughs> modulars could be an option. Um, every, every superintendent I talk to uh, it war has warned against modulars because they start off as temporary solutions. Um, they become permanent and they then become <laughs> maintenance, uh, big maintenance issues. So that is an, that is an option. Um, we also have to be wary of, of the footprint of our buildings, you know, and asking the question, where would we put that modular um, and how we would run things there. It, it, it looks like an easy solution, um, but, but in my experience, they've become albatrosses around districts next, um, you know, because they just deteriorate fairly quickly um, and, and generate a lot of problems, you know, so certainly something we could explore to give the the, the, the board to some it. options um, I would just heavily caution us to really consider that um, j just because of, you know, I, I lived seven modulars that were supposed to be temporary in, in another life um, and, and they were they were extremely difficult to, to manage and maintain yeah. I understand that but I right now we have nothing <coughs> so I'm, all I'm asking is let's look at it Okay. Can't do, if we can't afford it, we can't afford it. But not to look at it, I don't think it's viable. He's off. Um, just to sort of summarize, though, it we think we can manage the space. It will be creative and maybe tight, but we're trying to figure it out. It will be creative and tight, but we think we can figure it out. Um, teachers on carts are nothing new. In fact, that was one of my first teaching jobs. I was a science teacher on a cart. So imagine the fun of doing labs on a cart. But, you know, I made it, I made it work because I was in part of a growing district that needed to build onto the building, and they needed an extra science teacher before they could get science labs built in, so they hired me on a cart. I'm not saying we'd put an elementary teacher on a cart. That's a little bit different than a science <laughs> teacher on a cart. But a specialist, it is something that is feasible. I mean, it's not an ideal option, but it's something that we could do. Other questions for Mrs. Lentz? Okay. So that brings our priority one must-have total to, um, if we, again, hire these uh, folks in-house, to $419,966 that we'll, we will have to add to the budget. It is not currently in our 23-24 preliminary budget. And if we would not hire these people and have to go the alternative route, it's going to cost us an additional, well, not additional, it'll cost us 467401 or an additional 47435 So again, either way, whether we're hiring our own staff or contracting out, we're going to have to add additional costs to the budget. And then down below in the blue box, you'll see other priority one requests. Um, we are seeing a potential need for special education services at our uh, Grace B. Lohr's um, University Elementary School. So to hire that teacher, it would be an additional $100,000. Um, to, um, we currently have a bocce coach. I don't know that we have an assistant coach, but we would like to be able to pay um, those positions a little bit better than what we do. Um, so we'd ask to add $1,827 to the budget for that. Um, we are asking to hire a part-time transportation routing planner. Um, that would cost the district uh, 25, well, I shouldn't say cost. It will cost the district 25,463. However, we are currently contracting for those services and we pay $46,000 in contracted service. So if we would bring that back in house, it would actually be a savings to the district of $20,537. We are also asking to um, hire an in-school suspension supervision um, classroom assistant at our high school. That would be an additional cost to the budget of $49,384. Off to the side, when you see additional cost savings to the district, there's an asterisk there. At this point, we cannot project 
um, what a savings would be, but we know that we're, there would be a savings there um, by having this in-school suspension in our schools. Um, we could defer maybe uh, costs to um, Kale, sending kids to the Kaola program and um, other placements outside the district. Particularly important for special edu uh, education students who have limitations on the amount of out-of-school suspension they can receive. Um, you know, often when, if and when we reach those um, limits, we have to look at outside placements, which are astronomically expensive. And then the last thing on our list, you'll see it says executive session item. This is one thing that we can't talk about in public at this point, and there is no cost listed there. It's to be determined. So in the blue priority without the executive session item, that's an additional $208,833 to the budget and then some if we um, are able to do anything with the executive session item, bringing the grand total of the priorities to a minimum of $628,799 if we keep it in district or uh, potentially $738,717 plus if we have to contract outside the district. So that brings us to our summary page. I have added two columns to the summary budget now to show um, the first column is the totals without the new personnel request list. Um, the second column is showing um, what the cost would look like to the budget if we hire all the priority one must have list. And then the third column is all priority ones. So um, our tax revenues at this point as of April 24th with no tax increase, we're esti estimating revenues at 62.6 .6 million. Our expenditures um, from the last time I presented at March 13th, we were at 65.5 million. We have since added um, $214,845 to the budget um, for the technology budget, um, $380,735 <coughs> for the transportation budget, and $96,523 for the special education budget, bringing our expenditures as of April 24th to about $66.2 million. That brings us to a deficit of about $3.6 million. Um, if we were to increase taxes to the index, currently we're estimating that would be an additional uh, revenue of $1.5 million to the district. Using $400,000 of fund balance for our seventh grade teaching positions, it brings us down to a, a revised deficit of about $1.67 million. Keep in mind down below, um, sh if we would get what the governor proposed, um, that would give us an additional $1.5 million in revenue, state revenue, and would bring the deficit down to 149105 If you move over to the priority um, one must-have columns, just going to go down to the bottom where you see the, the surplus and deficit. Um, if we would, again, increase taxes to the index and use fund balance for the seventh grade teaching positions, we're at a deficit of just over $2 million. And if we would get what the governor proposed, we would be at a deficit of 569000 And then if we would do all the um, priority ones, which does not include a cost for the executive session item, uh, that brings us our deficit down to about $2.3 million. If we would get the what the governor proposed, we would be at a deficit of about 778000 Which lo locally is, is not bad. Uh, I met with Cumberland Valley's uh, superintendent this morning in a meeting, and he, he was projecting a $6 million deficit. Um, and I know, I uh, believe Big Spring is looking at a 1.6 or more uh, budget <coughs> deficit as well. May I ask a question? It's not, the, the, um, the deficit, the, are we, you talk about money from the governor, is that including money for special education or that? Yes. That's, that includes that? Yes. Yeah, so down below, um, I, I abbreviate BEF and SEF, so that means basic education funding and special education funding, so it's both of that money from the state. Okay, so closing remarks, that brings us to um, our next Budget and Finance Committee meeting. Um, we're going to have a standalone um, Budget and Finance Committee meeting, not part of a committee of the whole, on Monday, May 1st at 7 p.m. And hopefully we can get through the remaining um, uh, individual budgets that we have not looked at yet and bring to you a tentative um, proposed final budget. <coughs> 
so that hopefully um, the board would be willing to approve that on May 8th so we can go through the state requirements of mm -hmm. advertising the proposed final budget so then we can land at adopting a final budget no later than June 12th. And again, just keep in mind, when you uh, adopt a proposed final budget, it does not mean that you can't make changes between the proposed and the final budget. So we have a whole month in there that we can be making changes um, to the proposed final. Is there any other questions? Okay, so May 1st is, is uh, another time for us to talk and dive deep into the budget process. And just as a reminder, that is not the day of a normal uh, board meeting, so that is a standalone budget and finance committee meeting. It starts at 7 and can go as long as we want it to go. Correct. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our <laughs> committee of the whole meeting. 30 seconds to take a breath before we start the yeah. regular meeting. <coughs> Just get it to me by May 1st. Do you have any days in mind? No, she just wanted to find out when she's ready. So, so you don't need to fill this out? Just sign this page. Fill that out for me. All right. We'll call to order this uh, planning and action meeting of the Shippensburg Area School District School Board. Uh, uh, roll call, please. Mr. Jim Bard. Here. Mr. Levi Kressler. Here. Dr. Michael Lyman. Here. Mr. Kurt Noggle. Here. Mr. Fred Scott. Here. Mr. Charlie Suters. Here. Mrs. Becky Wolfinger. Here. Mrs. Steph Eberly. Here. Dr. Nathan Goats. Here. Mr. Arian Gaunkar. Here. Ms. Lily Kell. Here. All right, if you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. As we begin our deliberations this evening, let us once again be reminded of our duty to represent all of the children of the school community, regardless of age, sex, race, or creed, or regardless of need or ability. A reminder that this meeting is being live streamed and uploaded to the district's YouTube channel. Uh, may we now have a moment of silence to reflect on our thoughts, plans, and actions on behalf of the students in the Shippensburg Area School District. All right. Um, did I understand correctly that we do not have past? We, we uh, sorry. This is for the agenda, not for the agenda approval. Right. Correct. I'm sorry. So, uh, do we have a motion to approve the agenda? <coughs> motion to approve. Thank you. Motion made by Ms. Ever Mrs. Everly. Second. Second by Mrs. Wolfinger. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Sorry, I was getting a little ahead of myself. 
All right, so we are at the citizens' comment period of our meeting. Uh, it looks like there are several people who have signed up to uh, comment regarding agenda items. Um, when called, if you would please identify yourself by name and address and indicate which agenda item you are speaking about. Uh, please address all comments to the board as a whole and make sure they are in the form of a statement. Questions will be taken under advisement. Responses to questions will be offered after due deliberation will be provided by the superintendent at the direction of the board within a few days of the board meeting. Uh, each commenter is allowed three minutes for their comments. Comments relative to private student matters or personnel issues should be directed to the appropriate school authority outside of this meeting. The presiding officer reserves the right to interrupt or terminate a participant's statement when the statement is too lengthy, personally directed, abusive, obscene, and or uh, or irrelevant, meaning not related to an agenda item. So uh, we've got uh, quite a bit of people today, and that is awesome. Uh, we are excited to have uh, you participate in our school board meetings. And several people who have signed up uh, pre or have indicated that they want to um, make uh, some comments. Um, just a reminder that you, your time is limited to three minutes, and we will keep time, and I unfortunately will have to stop you if you go over uh, the three-minute mark um, so that we can be fair to everyone. All right, so first on our list is uh, Roxy Lehman, I believe. No? No, okay. Uh, Troy Bean. Yes, please, if you come up to the mic, please. Thank you. And just a reminder to speak right into the mic, you got to be kind of close, especially for those uh, at home to hear. I, I, I didn't see it on the agenda, but I, was, I called and talked to two of the board members about 94 Mount Rock Road. It was put up, it was a double wide on a rented lot that was put up for sale. And the people that supposedly bought it and are waiting on the board's approval to accept the sale, which I understood was going to be on the agenda, I didn't find it. It's I believe it's item 5D. I have D, okay, all right, must have overlooked it. But anyway, um, people that's buying that is gonna end up in the same situation because they're not being approved to get on the lot. So I guess uh, I talked to the assessment office and they mentioned to get a hold of the school district. If they, you don't approve it, if you don't approve that, then it'll go back up for sale. It'll be actually sold for more. And then the school district will immediately start getting the taxes off of it. Otherwise, it's gonna end up in the same situation where it was before. So I guess to make it short and simple, um, I would, I'm, I'm just here to let the board know what the status is on it and that if it's approved, then it's going to go back into the same type of foreclosure because the people's not approved to move on to the lot. They can't afford to pay the back lot rent. Um, they just got evicted out of where they're at now. So it's another problem coming that you won't collect the taxes if it goes back for sale. We weren't notified, the lot owners weren't notified that it was coming up for sale. That's how it got into this quagmire. So the assessment office, once it went, the bids opened up. The only way they can pull it back off is the school district does not approve the sale. And when you say not notified, it's it's the county that county the county yeah the county assess, tax assessment office right. They we they were they, they were called and they don't know how they got missed. They said by law they don't have to. It's a standard they do notify the lot owner. They didn't in this situation, and so the, the property's going to end up back in the same situation it was with no taxes collected. If it does go back up for sale, now that the lot owner's aware of it, they will start paying the taxes immediately when it comes back up for sale. So the only way to stop it now is the board not to approve the sale. If they do, they're only getting like 150 bucks or something. <laughs> I mean, if it, if it doesn't, then they're gonna get more ultimately, and it's gonna, the tax will start being paid on it relatively quickly if it comes back up for sale. I just wanted to make the board aware of it. I, we just found out about a couple of days ago, so I was following up on it and just wanted to give that report to the board. And I guess when it comes up, if you don't approve it, that's great for the lot owner. It's probably even good for the people that's trying to buy it because they're going to lose their money if it's, it is approved. They'll go back into default. Okay. Thank Questions? You. I'm sort of confused. It's a, it's a double wide lot. That's that's on a rented <coughs> lot on ni at ninety on Mount Rock Road, ninety four Mount Rock Road, and they fell behind on the taxes on the on the mobile home itself, not the lot. The lot's up to date, so they the tax office put it up for sale, and it was sold 
and the school district has to, I mean, if the school, school district doesn't have to accept the sale amount, which was ridiculous, <laughs> you know, you're only going to receive $150, I think, after everything's done and said, out of several thousand dollars in taxes. If the board approves it, that's what you get. If the board don't, then it'll go back up for sale, and then it'll be more money generated off of it. Mr. Scott, we'll have more chance to discuss this when it comes up. Yeah. It is something that needs discussion, so thank you. Yeah, just if any questions, I just will take them. Thank you. Uh, Carol Thornton. Good evening. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I'm with the Partnership for Better Health. My name is Carol Thornton. I'm the Director of Grants and Public Policy. And we're a health foundation in Carl that invests in ideas, initiatives, and collaborations across 10 school districts, including <laughs> Shippensburg. And I'm here tonight to talk about the screening and referral, the care solace and terrorist metrics. Um, just to clarify that we are funding the grant through the Shippensburg Community Resource Coalition to do that work. So what you're on voting tonight is using our grant funds to support that work. And I just want to express our continued support and ask that you do approve it. Um, our foundation has increasingly heard from community members about the need for supports for youth in addressing mental health all the way from basic, minor, to more serious issues. And we know that across the nation, 20% of youth have had depression, but only 10% received treatment. And we know from the Pennsylvania Youth Survey that in our 10 district region, 42.8% of students have had depressed, depression or sadness over the last 12 months, with an average of 50 for Shippensburg Area School District. So that is ranking higher than our region. But I also am here to commend you on the things you've already been doing. You have social workers, you have counselors, you've done positive behavior intervention uh, systems. Um, and screening referral is just really the next thing in your toolbox to really take it to the next level and to really look at not only what the kids need, but also what are their protective factors? What is working well? Um, and taking that information and you know, not necessarily every student will need clinical advisement, but maybe it's developing programs and supports and identifying community um, resources to help those students. And you already know this, you have a community that's very invested in your youth from the Shippensburg Community Resource Coalition, the Social Work Department at Shippensburg University. Um, they are there for you that um, I have listened to the recent board meetings on YouTube and um, you are really a leader among all the districts in South Central PA and you really could take this and really um, for the benefit of your students, really um, improve their lives both at home and in school. So with that, um, I'm gonna again say thank you for having me tonight. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Stolfer. Hello, my name is Jeremy Stolfer. I reside in the hearts of my student athletes. First, I want to say that in no way should this school district or any other school district ever forcefully implement anything to our children or parents, the terrorist matrix, especially without any information or questions answered from the school. I've spoke with many families who have no idea what this even is, and the research is all one-sided. My guess is you are not giving out any info because you do not fully understand it yourself. It's just a way for the schools to legally question our children and interrogate them without their parents or guardians being present. Sign off on your, parent or on your children's rights to your children is what you're asking the parents to do. There is no help in this system at all, just charts and graphs to help schools segregate our children so that our children don't segregate themselves. It sounds silly when it's spoken out loud. This is also only being put in as an opt out so that you can justify the cost of participation with, this, with the public and become a part of yet another national survey. 
For all the public knows, this may also come with some sort of monetary kickback like you got with COVID planning that failed, and that money has also disappeared. You want this for awareness? But if you think you need this, wouldn't you already be aware? What you need is programming for our students. I just thought of something. How about a nice place for our children to meet, talk, interact, play sports? Instead of washing your hands with the we did not know excuse, why don't you do something about the elephant in the room, the sports complex? A place for all the kids to go, learn and interact. It is full of counselors, friends, parents, teachers, and coaches. Everything that you were looking for in the terrace ma matrix, but it would be in your school's property with access for your children and not hidden from the parents. I'm going to say this so that you are aware. We do not need the terrace matrix to tell the parents what the kids are up to. What we need is a place for our children to gather and become one, not many. Build a fully functional stadium. If you truly want to help our children grow, be proactive, not reactive for once. Uh, Wendy Tomzak. My name's Wendy Tomzak. I live at 11058 Hurley Drive in Chippensburg. You bring the mic down, ma'am. And I'm speaking about the sports complex. Yeah. Ma'am, can you oh, pull the microphone a little closer? Speaking about the sports complex, um, I have a bit of a different view about it. Um, I learned recently that you're still considering building a stadium on school grounds. Um, I thought that the notion of committing the district's taxpayers to spending millions of dollars for a new stadium had wisely been put to bed. Um, I was, it was an unpleasant surprise when I found out that that was not the case. Financial help of many of the people in the school district is, now, is worse now than it was when I addressed this last time. I said before that I don't think any of you will be particularly adversely affected by the increase in property taxes but many of the people in Chippensburg will be. Um, at this particular time, we're not in a good place financially as a country, let alone as the district. Um, inflation is a daily fact of life. We're facing the very real possibility of a recession if we're not already in one, and we have more families every day that can't make ends meet and are tapping into resources like Christ Among Neighbors and SPO. We have classrooms that are already overcrowded, and I imagine not only do we need to expand, but there are upgrades and repairs that need, that need to be made, and those repairs won't come cheap. I've never understood the obsession with a new stadium on school property. I grew up in Chippensburg and felt no less pride in my school or our team because our games were played at Veterans Stadium. We actually went to watch the games and cheer on the team. I still know every word of our alma mater. We sang it at every home game. And yes, I know that the facilities at Veterans Stadium need a lot of repairs, but there is apparently an alternative the university had offered before to try to help uh, alleviate the problem temporarily, and I understand they're still interested in helping to do so. If that's the case, I un and that there may be a, a playing, a, maybe playing a couple of games there as a trial. If that's the case, and you do so as a, a, an honest effort to find out if it'll work, that's great. If it's just to say, well, we tried and it doesn't work, then shame on you. Um, sports is an important part of the school's <laughs> experience a source of pride. There are a lot of things that sports can teach. But the first responsibility has to be the benefit of all the children in the school district and having adequate facilities, both space-wise and technology-wise, that they can learn. Overcrowded classrooms and marginal facilities won't allow for that. That's where the focus needs to be, rather than on a sports complex. Um, I'd like to see a coming together of all the sections of the district and the university working together to find a reasonable solution to this problem, but everyone has to be willing to listen and, and to compromise. Last point. I mentioned the last time I spoke, that if, I, I spoke that if you are determined on this project, before you commit the taxpayers of this district to borrow now $6 million and to increase their property taxes, that will absolutely follow. You need to give them a voice in that decision. <laughs> it needs to go on a ballot and be voted for by the members of the district. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tomczak.
Uh, Darren Donovan. <clears throat> uh, Darren Donovan, I am a resident of the district. I uh, want to speak on Terrace Metrics Program. Uh, if I'm a board member, this is a no vote for me, the way it is written. If anything, it needs to be an opt-in. But honestly, I don't like it at all. There are far too many unanswered questions and vague answers to those questions for me to be okay with an outside organization administering questionnaires to our kids. As I listened over the past few meetings, gathering what others are saying about this organization and how they want to help our kids, I think we can all agree that we want to help our kids. And on the surface, maybe this looks like a good idea. But if you do any kind of research on this company, I have a hard time finding something that allows me to be okay with it. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Uh, and Bella Kyle. Um, my name is Isabella Kyle. I live at 210 Pike Court, Shippensburg, PA. Could you, could you just slide you get closer over to, to the, the microphone Sorry. a little bit? Thank you. And I'm a sophomore here at Sashes. Um, I would like to talk about the ter Paris Metrics and Care Solace. Um, I've been struggling with mental health for years. However, it started to get bad around the seventh grade. Um, I had stopped going to therapy due to COVID, so I didn't know who to talk to. I felt sad, scared, and alone. I felt this way up until last summer when I started to have some serious thoughts of suicide. I went to my mom and said I wanted to go to therapy again. When we found a good counselor that suited me, I began seeing him weekly, but it took us time to figure out that what I was struggling with was anxiety and severe depression. I got put on medications and started seeing my therapist bi-weekly. I believe that these screenings could allow students to realize that they too could be struggling with anxiety and or depression. It is important to realize what it is you are struggling with so you can get the proper help that you need. I believe that the upsides to voting yes to the terrorist metrics and care solace with the opt out to give the students and parents a choice to participate will have far more benefits than downsides. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Kyle. Uh, are there any other comments from the public regarding agenda items? Yes, come on. Over here. You could just say your name and whether you're a resident of the district. Um, I'm Izzy Menser, and I'm a sophomore at Sashes, so. That answers that question. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm speaking in support of implementing the terrorist metrics and care solace screenings into our district. Growing up, I was completely surrounded by addiction and family issues that really impacted my childhood. I didn't know what was happening or that it wasn't normal until about middle school when I started noticing my anxiety and having anxiety attacks. I had trouble hanging out with my friends and family, and I was overall just sad and stressed. When ninth grade started, it had gotten worse, and I got to the point where I had serious thoughts of suicide and self-harm. I was too scared to ask for help. My anxiety was keeping me from asking for help to deal with it. However, this wasn't obvious as I was in sports, clubs, very involved in the community, in honors classes, and getting straight A's. Some students aren't able to ask for help or don't feel comfortable doing this on their own. It took me multiple years before I finally was able to have a conversation with my mom asking for help. I know many other students are also in the same situation or experience similar things. I feel the terrorist metrics and care solace screenings would help them get help. I believe that if I was able to take the screenings and get flagged in third or sixth grade, get help from the counselors or other adults, I wouldn't have had to go through what I did all at once without support. Passing this program to be used in our school would, would benefit so many students, and it could save lives. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And I believe there was one other. Yes. Good evening. My name is Barbara Dickey, and I live in the district. Uh, good evening, board members, and those people that just came on the board, I uh, congratulate you, and as we have the uh, uh, doing well for the re-election in May. I'm so glad to be back. Like many of you, I've been picking up the pieces from COVID in my private practice, but 
I have several items in which to address. I had somebody call me tonight and say, and I did ask for five minutes, and I'm hearing that you dissed that. We might want to check to see if that's part of Sunshine, because... Uh, we we have, ma'am. Um, okay, good. Uh, one, somebody called and asked, well, where was the agenda? And we couldn't find it. So it's there. Might be able to have some help as to how to find it on the website. Okay? I'm, I'm hearing that Hair uh, Solace Terrace Metrics is up for a vote tonight, if I'm not mistaken. It's my understanding that a vote for this country to be brought on the board was tabled a few months ago, but when representation from the company was here, they were asked the following questions, and I thank the couple people that asked those questions. What's to be done with the information about students? I think as we collect information, know where it goes. If I thought that it was going to be staying right here, it was not going to be sent out, that would be a different question. And who has access to it? Who is it sold to and et cetera? Two reps were unable to answer that question and whether they didn't know or didn't want to answer, but I think that's something to really consider. Because right now with identity fraud, with so many people uh, having difficulties, uh, to be aware. And if you get on their website, there's a lot of questionable things about uh, what they're doing. So I ask you to take a look at that. Uh, and, and look at why we need a third party to examine mental health with our students who cannot answer adequately the safety of our students' information. I'd be willing, as a, uh, as a person of this uh, uh, school district, to sit down and brainstorm with some ideas. I've been in education for 53 years and a private practice 25. This is what I'm into, preschool to, uh, to college. Don't we have school counselors? Don't we have professional people in the field who can access information which is protected with or with a release of information? Will all of you fully understand this company's agenda? If you've not looked at their website and studied it thoroughly, I ask that you do that and maybe table not voting tonight. Clearly their agenda is not what I hear these two students asking about because I sit and I cry with students as we've gone through what many of them experienced during COVID, the breakdown of the family. There's so many issues. And what about validation studies which address false negatives and false positives that so do not pick up on the problems? There's a lot of uh, uh, things that are not working. Are we wanting to put this in place of telling parents they can opt out? Are all parents made aware of what's going on? Are we creating a mental health facility like we did a medical facility during COVID? I'm concerned. We are an education crowd and are we about that? What's our ultimate purpose? As an educator who has taught preschool to college, I have a mental health addiction private practice. I strongly ask you to reject bringing them on board until you fully understand everything going on with them. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any, any other, anyone else? <clears throat> Terrific, thank you. All right, uh, we have uh, reports from our student representatives. Um, start with Ms. Kell. Oh, thank you. Um, so first we'll begin with the high school happenings. The high, school's current, or the high school held a construction table, trades exploration day on April 18th in which students will um, get to go on a trip to Lemonin Valley College to explore the construction industry. Um, the varsity softball team is currently looking for an announcer to look at to help at home games. The athletic office will provide a schedule for those interested in this position. For all students interested in careers involving PennDOT will be taking a trip to PennDOT maintenance facility in Harrisburg to explore more careers within the field. Today, the Red Cross held a blood drive at the high school to collect donations from students over 16. The high school will be holding a business of baseball career field trip on May 11th, where the students interested in baseball will get to experience a learning. Uh, sorry, will get to experience and learn about the sports field and sports management at the Senator Stadium. Last Friday, seniors voted on senior superlatives. Students at Sashes had the opportunity to join the annual Minithon volleyball tournament, at which will be held on at, at Big Spring on April 29th. I will now be passing the rest of the report to Aryan Gonkar. Thank you. Uh, the base bicycle company has begun recruiting for summer jobs in Shippensburg. <coughs> high schoolers have the opportunity to apply and join. The high school drama club has held shows for the play 
buffs or seven increasingly eventful years at a certain school of magic and magic. It's a pretty long title. These shows were held last fr Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Students will have the opportunity to view and learn from a li live robotic hysterectomy while, while via a high school field trip to the Whitaker Center. Students interested in the f medical field can join in on the trip, which will take place on April 27th. Seniors have nominated their prom king and queen. The voting was done last week. Prom tickets are being sold for $50 during all lunches this week. At the middle school, student council posted a penny wars with uh, eight classes claiming to win for their team. Each winning class will have $250 to donate to the charity of their choice. The PBIS team there had a successful third marking period rewards day with options such as teach teacher versus student basketball games, a movie, or a dance. Finally, the student council is hosting spirit weeks for PSSAs with days such as wear bright, since days such as wearing bright colors or sully socks. All right, thank you, Ms. Kell and Mr. Goncar. Uh, Franklin County Career Center report. Got, wait, got a problem with the thing. Connects. Oh, I'm sorry, is there more? They can't see. <laughs> Public can't see. Are we good, Dr. Stevens? I'm confused. What are we waiting on? <laughs> Did that uh, apparently go off, Dr. Stevens? Are we still live on YouTube or no? Yeah, we're, we're live on YouTube. They can't see. So it's just the audience can't see. The audience can't. All right. <clears throat> we're good? Okay. Then we're back. All right. <laughs> Do we have a report from the Franklin County Career Center? The meeting's this Thursday. We'll look forward to that next week. Uh, I believe we had two uh, board committees that uh, met. Uh, athletics, did athletics meet. Did, did, we we did um, to discuss the counter proposal for uh, use of Memorial Park. That was the only agenda item. Okay, that's still in progress. Uh, facilities committee. We did have one. I thought Chad was going to be here, but a lot of the stuff that we prioritize is going to be on the agenda we moved them up to out of the uh, discussion agenda on uh, a couple of them we worked with on the voting of the agenda Charlie I don't know if everyone can hear it's hard, it's hard to hear you Mr. Seuss could you use the mic a little bit <laughs> sorry <laughs> speak <laughs> some of them we put on the agenda for to be voted on okay for emergency use. high priority items on the yeah. discussion item oh, okay gotcha all right, curriculum report, Ms. Woodall. Okay, um, Lauren was going to present with me, but since she can't see up there, or can you see now? Oh, it's up now? Okay. So we just wanted to provide an update on Alternative High School this year. If you recall, we brought this program in-house um, utilizing Shippensburg University and hiring one of our teachers to help with this program. So the purpose of Alternative High School is basically to provide an opportunity for students who are credit deficient to allow them to catch up on their credits to be able to graduate with their cohort. Um, we started at the beginning of this year, like I said, operating our own Alternative High School. Um, that basically happened due to um, our former partnership with Affinity in their Alternative High School. It was a consortium with the districts in Franklin County along with us where we sent our students for Alternative High School to Affinity. Basically, over the years, the other districts had backed out. Last year, Shippensburg was the only district that was there, 
and the resources that they had. They actually had to use us for a lot of their resources. So Lauren and I um, were working together this year to try to figure out how can we supply a better resource to our students um, just because Affinity wasn't able to meet our needs anymore since the other districts pulled out. So some glows for this year. Um, we started off this school year in August with seven seniors and two juniors. Um, we've grown, which is not necessarily a good thing, but we are serving our students. We're currently serving 12 seniors and six juniors. Most of those additions were students who moved in their senior year in the November, December, extremely credit deficient, extremely credit deficient. So um, that's why we had that increase because we had so many new enrollees in November, December that were extremely credit deficient. Of the seven seniors that began in August, three will graduate on time and two are on the pathway to graduate on time. What that means is basically the three are finished and two are following their pathway to where they'll finish to graduate on time. Um, and then one of the additional, or of the additional seniors added later on, one has completed and will graduate and one is on the pathway to graduate. Again, many of the seniors that came in late were extremely credit deficient. Um, another glow that we had is we've helped facilitate 11 of the 16 students gain, um, have gainful employment. One of our students is working at JLG and he has a fantastic job. <laughs> it's, it's amazing what we've been able to facilitate with that. Some bro program barriers that we have, um, our enrollment numbers increased right at a tough time for students as well. So our, we initially started fairly low with our students in there and November, December, January is a tough time for students typically when we have engagement falling off at that point in time. So we added more students at a time when students start falling off from their engagement. So we need to needed to ensure that we're offering more supports and opportunities to keep our students engaged. Our students enrolling late with limited credits, um, one of the things that we've been brainstorming around and actually working with our um, PIMS coordinator is the facilitation of GED programming for next year to help those students that are extremely credit deficient. It wouldn't hit our dropout rates and it would actually help them. Um, some of them are so credit deficient, I don't know if they'll even be able to finish by the time they're 21. And then transportation and start times. We've actually been surveying the students and currently we run at eight to 11 and they've been saying that they're more likely to be engaged if it was nine to 12. So working with transportation to try to see can we get our transportation to and from the university nine to 12 rather than eight to 11 to help with that student engagement. And then 11th grader apathy. What I mean by that is our seniors they, they see the light at the end of the tunnel, so they're, they're working and hustling. The 11th graders, because that light's still a little far for them, they're, they're slowly progressing. Um, and then, Lauren, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Sure. Um, as with any new program, or any program in general, um, we allow data to drive our program changes. So throughout the past uh, year, we did make some revisions based on the data and trends that we were seeing. Um, one of the um, first changes that we made is the addition of home visits um, completed by our one of our district social workers to facilitate student engagement and attendance. Um, we also f worked with building and administration um, to create school attendance improvement plans. Um, similar to that, we would do of our students who are attending in district programs, um, you know, separate from the alternative high school. We added a weekly social skills group, um, which is facilitated by one of our district social workers um, as a means of supporting students in terms of uh, mental health struggles or things that they may be working through. And we revised the admission pr um, process to ensure that alternative high school is the appropriate option for the student. Um, so again, it's not just about student desire, but um, you know, in terms of credits, in terms of student motivation, in terms of learning style and path, um, is alternative high school the most appropriate option? And of course, looking into the future, we do have a couple of additional recommended program revisions. So for next year, we, um, are considering assigning a building administrator at the high school as a point of contact. Um, that was previously how building administration um, facilitated alternative high school, so we've been in communication with um, the high school administration to determine if that makes most sense 
obviously they have more in-depth knowledge regarding the students and needs, um, as well as their learning preferences and credits available to them. Uh, we would like to continue to explore um, service delivery for special education students. Um, so again, can we make that more robust um, given um, you know, an option for special needs students? We would again like to create a GED pathway um, for students who are enrolling with extreme credit deficiencies as a point of reference. You know, we have students who are enrolling with three credits in their junior and senior year. Um, you know, it, it, it is regardless of any program, it, it, you know, at this point, it is not going to be viable to obtain that many credits in, in a year or two. And then the exploration of a delayed start time. So are there any questions? Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. Don't uh, <laughs> interpret our lack of questions for lack of interest. <laughs> uh, Mr. August. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, just two items. Donation report. Uh, again, just acknowledging uh, our supportive community members. An anonymous monetary donation to the Middle School Food Service Department uh, to clear designated student meal balances. The uh, value of the donation was $1,279.90. Uh, thank you to the Nori, Nori Media Group for their monetary donation to the Shippensburg High School PBIS program, a $100 donation. Cumberland Valley Lodge number 315, a donation towards the Senior High Facility Dog Program of $100. Uh, uh, Kiwanis Club of Shippensburg for their monetary donation towards the high school facility dog program, a uh, thousand dollar donation, and Beta Sigma Phi monetary donation towards the high school facility dog program of five hundred dollars. Thank you, Mr. August. Uh, uh, item three E B um, is the other item. I wanted to acknowledge that we received a uh, correspondence from the borough. Uh, in regard to more Memorial Park, I believe all the email, uh, board members uh, were emailed the proposal. Um, it is attached to the agenda. Uh, essentially, it is a, an opportunity to lease the park um, and you know go through different iterations of moving things and building the, an athletic facility there. Um, I wanted uh, the public and the board to know that we received that correspondence. If there's any comments from the board at this time yeah we certainly can take them and that letter is attached to the agenda correct yes sir that's all i have sir all right thank you all right that brings us to the consent agenda um item 4a so our uh minutes uh are not uh, from our last board meeting are not available due to staff member vacations uh, but they will be available at our next, uh, our next board meeting, so I don't think that we will vote on item 4A. Um, item 4B is our finance report. Item 4C, high school exchange student. An exchange student from Germany has met all the qualifications to attend Shippensburg Area High School for the fall semester. Administration recommends approval of this exchange student. Item 4D uh, represents uh, the continued work of the policy committee uh, in updating uh, several policies. Um, all of these policies are uh, uh, <coughs> been attached to the agenda. I'm not going to read through them all. Um, and, uh, uh, and that brings us to personnel. So um, I'm going to have a motion to approve items 4B. 4C and 4D. Dr. Goods, I, if I have a question about 4C. Would you like to take that separate? I mean, that, yeah, that's fine. Okay, can I have a motion to uh, approve items 4B and 4D? Motion to approve. Motion made by Ms. Wolfinger. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Lyman. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. Uh, is there a motion to approve item 4C? Yes, move to approve. <laughs> motion made by Mr. Kressler. Is there a second? Second. Second by uh, Mr. Suter's discussion. Just curious if we found any place for these <laughs> foreign exchange student flags that we got. I, I, did, I did talk with uh, Mrs. Luffy. Um, th there is some movement to, to hang them in here. Awesome. Um, th 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 sometimes we get them. We, we don't always purchase them, is my understanding. Sometimes they're given to us. 
um, you know, I think that might be factored into the you know, proposed high school renovations as well. I just think it's a super cool idea that whenever we get these, these kids that are doing their uh, – coming here as an exchange student that we kind of, like, remember them. And I think we're probably got a nice little collection of flags. I, I don't know that we have them all, but I know we have a lot, uh, according to my conversation with her. That was it. Thank you. All right. All in favor of item 4C? Four, uh, four Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. All right, item 4E is uh, personnel. Um, there are a number of appointments. Um, the substitutes, I'm not going to read through them all, but they are all listed in the agenda. Um, several appointments, leave requests. And <coughs> your coach uh, approvals. Uh, is there a motion to uh, approve item 4E? Motion to approve. Motion made by Ms. Everly. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Wolfinger. Any discussion? Yes. <laughs> Number seven. Old time custodian worker at $12 an hour. $12 an hour we're hiring people. That we is uh, the rate within the association and have, have I know I've been asking, I know Mr. Souter's been asking, have we made any movement to change, to discuss changing this? Thing? We, we have, Mr. F Scott. Um, so th that would be a budget item um, that would need to be added to the budget line item. So, th so we will be talking about that, uh, what, what number the board is comfortable entering into, into negotiations to reopen that contract. Can we do it soon? I know not, not without so the, the trouble is mr. Scott we we have to know how much money we can commit to it first and that is a part of the budget process so so to enter in negotiations and not have our own financial kind of homework done for what we can offer would would just be fruitless um, you know the, the the board would need to come to a decision through the budget process to determine the amount of money um, to be allocated to open up that negotiations. I have no problem with that. I know Mr. Suters and I and a couple of the board have been asking for two years to increase the salary of our custodial workers. So, so we're in that process, Mr. Scott. It, it just is going to take some time for us to get through the budget um, first so that we can open that up and have those discussions. Didn't you share information on Friday, last Friday in the email? Uh, I think I inclu may, maybe included that in a in a budget update and I think you know we, we had some uh, personnel discussions also in executive session but we're, we're going next month we're going to pass the budget right so so, so once we get the clarity of that line item um, we'll, we'll be able to be in earnest open that process up who makes that when is that clarity coming forward with with a past budget mr. Scott so, so when when so that, that money is got to be in the budget for us to be able to negotiate. So when we settle on a budget, you know, we can start that process. But, okay, I have no problem with that, but when are we going to sit down and come up with that proposed? So, so I mean, the, we're, the, the budget process, I think, is due June. June 12th is when we would like the board to approve the final budget. When we have a final, final approved budget, Mr. Scott, then we can have those discussions with that association. Then we, if we increase it, there won't be the final budget, will it? If we, we offer, we're we're, we're going to budget as if we're entering and opening that that contract up. So so there will there will be monies in the budget to to have that discussion with the association. But until we have a finalized budget, there, we can't know how much um, we're we're negotiating that that with them. You know, we, we need to know ourselves um, what what we can offer. We can't do that without a finalized budget. <clears throat> Any other discussion? All in favor of item 4E? The Aye. motion to approve item 4E? I'm sorry. Aye. Aye. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Thank you. All right, that brings us to the action agenda. Item 5A, uh, hold 
uh, Del Hayes USA Incorporated. In other words, the giant uh, company uh, is requesting authorization to donate um, uh, nearly $4,000 uh, from their Feeding School Kids program to, uh, uh, to provide food assistance. Uh, and according to policy, um, a donation of that amount must, um, must receive board approval. Is there a motion to approve item 5A? Motion to approve. Motion made by Mrs. Everly. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Wolfinger. <coughs> uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Item 5B, uh, the disposal of obsolete, uh, obsolete textbooks. Um, so these are textbooks that have been replaced um, and uh, are now um, we're ready to dispose of them. Uh, is there a motion to approve item 5B? Motion to approve. Motion made by Mrs. Wolfinger. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Kressler. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Item 5C, Read Naturally Incorporated Subscription. The administration recommends the approval of a one-year subscription with Read Naturally for K-3 student, K through three students at a cost of $1,610 for 70 licenses. Uh, and this is a renewal, correct? This is a, yes, sir. Yeah, renewal. Uh, is there a motion to approve item 5C? So moved. Motion made by Dr. Lyman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Wolfinger. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> All right, item 5D, repository sale consent. Um, so, uh, I'll just read what it says here. The Tax Claim Bureau of Franklin County has notified the district of a property <coughs> that is no longer in a tax generating status because the parcel has been placed in the county repository. The property has been offered for upset sale and judicial sale, but did not receive any bids to satisfy the municipal and or school tax obligations that were owned on this property, owed on this property. In order to bring the parcel back to tax generating status, the parcel must be sold. Therefore, the Tax Claim Bureau is requesting that the Board of School Directors provide their consent to the sale of the property for the repository bid price of $105. Um, is, uh, so this is, this is, well, this is the item that was spoke about earlier uh, by um, someone uh, from the public. Um, it's my understanding uh, that if the board does not approve this, then it would um, uh, it would be like open for bid again. But I don't know that we have any clear understanding of that. And it um, so one option may be to delay this um, until we have better understanding of, of the process here. Um, but is there a motion to approve item 5D? Of course, if there is no motion, then this will carry over, uh, we'll have to carry over to the next, um, or it can be put on the discussion agenda for the next meeting, uh, which will give us some time to do some more research about what to do about this item. Correct. All right, well, hearing no motion, the, uh, that will stay there. I thought if there was no motion, it literally just... It would it, goes to the it, table. it dies, right. So it's it's dead, so it would have to go on the discussion agenda for the next the next meeting if we were to take any action on it. Mm -hmm. So uh, so it's dead, um, uh, which will give us some more time to research and find out the implications of what, what the next steps are. Which we will do. Thank you. All right, item 5E is the uh, MOU between uh, the district and the Shippensburg Area Education Support Professional Association. Uh, this is uh, uh, to approve um, the secretary, um, it's, a, it's a retitling of a position to approve the secretary to the supervisor of special education. Um, this position will be retitled to secretary of student services. The appointment will be retroactive to February 13th, which is the date that the position of Assistant Director of Student Services became vacant the employment of a new Assistant Director of Student Services. Is there a motion to approve item 5E? Move to approve. Motion made by Mr. Suters, seconded by Ms. Everly. Is there uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 
Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Item 5F uh, is the MOU between uh, the Boys and Girls Club of Chambersburg and Shippensburg in the district regarding their before and after school program, which is an operation uh, at four of our schools and their eight-week summer program. The MOU is attached. Is there a motion to approve item 5F? So moved. Motion made by Dr. Lyman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Scott. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Item 5G is another MOU between the district and the uh, Shippensburg Area Education Association. Administration recommends the approval of the MOU between the district and, and the Shippensburg Area Education Association regarding new hires and the placement on the salary scale, uh, which um, clears up some confusion and creates an orderly process for uh, where new hires will be placed on the scale. Uh, is, there a motion may, is there a motion to uh, approve item 5G? Moved to approve. Motion made by Mr. Suters. Is there a second? Second. Uh, se Jim Bard. Se second by Mr. Bard. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Item 5H is a MOU for the Scissor Lift <coughs> Partnership. Administration recommends partnering with the Shippensburg Area Senior High School Band Boosters for use of their scissor lift uh, by the maintenance department. Uh, is there a motion to approve item 5H? Move to approve. Motion made by Mr. Suters. Is there a second? Fred Scott second. Second by Mr. Scott. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Our eyes are becoming a little anemic. <laughs> Express a little more enthusiasm. Uh, item 5I, fuel escalation clause in the transportation contract with Boyo for the fiscal year 22-23. So administration, along with board representation for the transportation committee, recommends that the district cover the entire overage in the fuel cost above uh, $300,000 amount uh, to be determined still uh, will be paid for by, uh, from the fund balance. Um, uh, so, uh, is there a motion to approve item 5I? Red Scott make a motion approve. Uh, motion made by Mr. Scott. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Noggle. Mr. Noggle, I'm sorry, I was just spacing on your name. I apologize there. Uh, by Mr. Noggle, is there any discussion? Uh, yeah, one thing, just to be clear, I think that we've kind of planned on maybe budgeting for this increase. Um, I think it was wish for <laughs> Again, circling back to that realistic budging yeah, um, the, uh, process. The path that everybody sees with fuel prices aren't coming down, so just we're planning ahead in our budget for next year. For Correct, Mr. Cresson. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all in favor of item five, or the motion to approve item 5I? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstain. <coughs> I'm sorry, what? Abstain. Abstain. Uh, could we have a roll call? Mr. Jim Bard. Yes. Mr. Levi Kressler. Yes. Dr. Michael Lyman. Yes. Mr. Kurt Noggle. Yes. Mr. Fred Scott. Yes. Mr. Charlie Suters. Abstain. Mrs. Becky Wolfinger. Yes. Mrs. Steph Eberly. Yes. Dr. Nathan Goats. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry, you, you, you like to say <laughs> that the motion passed. Motion carried. <laughs> um, eight yes, one abstention. Sorry, I cut you off there a little bit. Um, item 5J is the Eastern Elevator Repair. This is uh, for the Intermediate School Elevator. Administration recommends the approval of the attached agreement with Eastern Elevator uh, to remove the defective UPS unit, <coughs> install a new one in the elevator, uh, a new one in the elevator at a price of $2,220. Um, is there a motion to approve item 5J? Move to approve. Motion made by Mr. Suters. Is there a second? Second. second. Second by Mr. Bard. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Item 5K, appointment of financial advisor and bond counsel. Administration recommends the approval of the following. The Board of School Directors of the Shippensburg Area School District does hereby authorize the administration to work with PFM Financial Advisors, LLC, as, advisor, as financial advisor 
Eckert, Siemens, Charon, and Mellet LLP as bond counsel and the local solicitor in conjunction with the issuance of general obligation bonds series of 2023 in the approximate amount of $9,995,000 for the purpose of funding the new money needs of the district via a competitive internet auction. Uh, is there a motion to approve item five, what is this, item five K? Motion to approve. Motion made by Mrs. Wolfinger. Is there a second? Second. Second by Dr. Lyman. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, item 5L is an agreement with EI Associates. Uh, this is a revised motion based on discussions and concerns related to the maximizing the program against available funds for the project. This revised motion outlines that EI Associates will design options for the entire scope presented as part of the February 27th, 2023 board meeting. So administration recommends a motion to approve amendment number two to the EI Associates agreement dated December 1, 2021 to provide design services for the Shippensburg Area High School and Shippensburg Area Middle School at a fee of 7% of the cost of construction as outlined in the amendment. The design of the Shippensburg Area Senior High School shall include additional options for music slash choral space, FCS labs, the dining, large group instruction, instruction space, and shall also include renovation options for the auxiliary gymnasium, locker rooms, main gymnasium, kitchen, and guidance career center. The design of the Shippensburg Area Middle School shall include design of the pupil services and secure entry additions and renovation of the administration pupil services suite. Is there a motion to approve item 5L? I just got to make a motion. Motion made by Mr. Scott. Is there a second? Second. second. Second by Mr. Kressler. Any discussion? I have more of a comment, um, and, and it's probably just a nuance, but I mean, we have, again, included an attachment that still, if you open the attachment, shows the high school as having that. I, I think that's, I, color I hear. coding. Yeah. I think that's why they revised it, uh, Mrs. Wolfinger, to include the spe specifications and didn't go back and redraw. I would just remind the board that those are concept maps, um, the design process is to include those things. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, as we get down into the design drawings, you know, the board members. No, I know you're reminding the board, but if I'm a community member and I'm going to the agenda and I'm pulling that attachment and I see that as a part of what I'm, as a community member, looking and observing, my mind says, this is what I'm getting. So that should not have been attached, my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, it's important to note we do not have a final design of what this is going to look like. So, I mean, Ms. Wolfinger makes an excellent point. If you were looking at those pictures, that picture is not a picture of what we are approving. It's, it's just a, a potential concept. We have not yet approved a final design. Any other discussion? All right. Uh, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, item 5M. Uh, this is a motion for KW Athletic Improvements Design Direction. Administration recommends a motion to the board to validate design direction to allow KW, which is our engineering firm, to proceed with the design and permitting of work related to the athletic improvements at the high school site. Improvements to be designed include the following new synthetic turf field, new six lane running track, new grandstands, home side 1,000 seats, visitor side 1,000 seats, with ADA access, a new press box, new field events, paving, and related equipment site, uh, apparences, apparences, I've never seen that word before. Uh, new football goalposts and soccer goals, new, school board, new scoreboard, new fence at track perimeter, Accommodations for future utilities slash future buildings slash program. Utilities will, not be, utilities will not be installed and other related items required by code including but not limited to stormwater, erosion control, and parking requirements. Anticipated cost for construction is 
$101,163 with a project cost under $5,600,000. Is there a motion to approve item 5M? Fred Scott, make a motion to approve. Motion made by Mr. Scott. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Kressler. Any discussion? Yeah, I'd like to see more seating and lights up there, but uh, I'm still, I'm still going to be a yes on this to get started. But I would like to see more seats and, and some lights. I do believe that we, I saw a drawing where it was like 1,500 seats on the home side and 1,000 on the other. That was a concept floated uh, and is part of the expansion. You know, so as we look at, I, I think when we showed that, we, we showed everything we were proposing here and po potential future expansions, which would include those additional seating on the home side, Ms. Severly. But it, this is not concrete. This is something, the concept to get it started. We can add to it as we go. C correct. And, and I think, yes, absolutely. You, you, so the utilities are not going to be installed, but th it's going to be designed in a way that we don't have to rip up what we've already put down if, if and when the board decides to move forward with the next step of the, f uh, the phasing of this. Yeah, uh, I've, I've been pretty adamant about this one. Um, and, and the desire for like the whole thing. Um, but as, as Mr. Bard said, I, I'm willing to work with this. This gets us started. This addresses our biggest need, in my opinion, which is the track. Um, so that does that and, and just does everything that we, that in my opinion, that we need. Um, so it's going to take some work. This isn't like, like the final thing. Like it's not like we're ready to go tomorrow if this passes tonight. Um, I said it before, I'll say it again. I will continue uh, to work my tail off to help any way I can, uh, to help with the monies that come in for sponsorship plans and ad hoc committee, whatever it may be. Um, grants, I'm gonna let, up, let that up to Christy and the people much smarter than me. Uh, but I think that there's an opportunity for us to get all the things that we I think identify that we want. That's yeah. not gonna happen in the first, in this vote. But I think the opportunity is there. Um, and I think that it's the timeline of events is reasonable as well. Correct, Mr. Kressler, it shows a commitment by the district to, to move forward. And I think that makes the the executive director's job easier um, and and can certainly uh, bring about some some of the things that we want to have happen you know with that position you know towards um, the the kind of facility we we hope to ultimately have if this if this, if, this, if this vote passes and it be put down in gold on the contract <laughs> I'm not sure I'm not sure that mechanism Mr. Scott but uh, you know it certainly starts us down the road and, and commits us to the borrowing and the design um, and you know the, the, those those things go hand in hand um, and you know the it will certainly move move us forward towards that facility personally I'm excited about the movement that we've made and the progress that we've made um, this is a in my mind a reasonable project uh, and I am excited for what I believe uh, is some consensus amongst the board to initiate this project um, it doesn't solve all of our athletic needs we certainly have lots of other needs and they will be addressed but this is a great start and it gives us because we have a plan in motion it gives us the opportunity to seek out grants to do fundraising uh, to expand the project as you know as as opportunities arise for additional monies, but I, I think it's a I think it's a reasonable commitment um, for for district funds for this project, and I'm excited. Uh, Ms. Lentz, could we have a roll call vote on this one? I think we have. A, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Did I get the new information that we've received from the borough? It seems to me that there are some financial benefits to at least take a look at the borough, and because I've seen. Some of the uh, uh, con concept drawings that we've had, and it seems to me we could save a fair amount of money to add to some of the curriculum uh, areas that we need money. So I'd like to see us table it for 30 days, and we can't come up with any financial benefits to help our budget. Then we vote and we move forward. I'm not for that. I've been on the board three and a half years, almost four. I got plans from the borough in 2020 when I got on the borough on the school board. I got plans from 
spur on 2021 for this, to the school board. Plans 22, now I got plans 23. When do you stop? You've had ample time to produce. I understand that. Yeah, but, but for me, that, that comes to a point these kids are being held without, and I, 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 I think Memorial Park <clears throat> can be used, but not as a stadium. But the Memorial Park, if the school got, I think, what it was looking for, a, a, a lease that works well for the school. I keep hearing us talk about we're not going to have extra room for cramming uh, kids into some of the some of the school rooms that we don't have the room. I feel pretty certain that you'd be able to save a million bucks. But also know that if we build down that park, do you anticipate, do you anticipate us still paying the $30,000 a year to rent it? No. Did you read the letter that they gave? I read that, that was from a bird. That wasn't from the authority. So the authority has $30,000. If we pull that $30,000 a year out of that authority, it's now, going to fold. According to what I read and what I understand, the park, the football stadium, is ours for a dollar lease. Should at least inquire with the borough. <clears throat> you have. No, you, oh, in three years, you have. I'm so, saying. I mean, in, in my in my mind, this this uh, approving this motion does not uh, eliminate our need for a relationship with the borough, and we certainly can still explore that and I hope that we will because we, we definitely need that field in some respect uh, and and I I hope that we will you know that the district will continue to foster a healthy relationship with with the borough uh, in managing uh, Veterans Memorial Stadium for use you know for you know competition and practice and and whatever um, but uh, but this moves us forward with a track project uh, and, uh, and, and a field that uh, can be used for lots of sports uh, in a way that um, field at, at Veterans Memorial cannot. But, um, sorry, Mr. Noggle, you, you, you said that you wanted, I guess I'm asking a sort of formal question, are you making a motion to table uh, item 4 or 5L? I am making a motion to All right, table is, it for 30 days. Is, uh, so a motion to table needs a second? And, uh, and a majority of the board in order for it to succeed. Uh, is there a second to Mr. Noggle's motion? Fair enough. All right, no second, so that motion dies. Any more discussion on item 5L? Yeah, I, I feel what everybody's saying, but I don't think we close any doors, nowhere, because we need the community and we need Memorial Park Maybe not as it as it is, but we still need all the, all the game players in here. It's a, it's, I'm voting for this, but it don't change my desire still to have the Memorial Park a part of our school or the we university. We do have a feasibility study that should be fine tuned with all of those findings. Right. Um, I mean, we are still waiting on additional information to know the capacity, um, which, you know. And again, I think, you know, in Bill's email that he sent on Friday, the initial feasibility study that we all had the chance to review is, is kind of, you know, walking us through what, what the needs of the district are. And I think no matter how you look at it, you're going to have to have some partnership um, with Memorial or, or wherever. But we absolutely need something here at this high school. I mean, we need it. These kids deserve to have this at the high school. Um, and it, I think it, it's going to serve the purpose for a lot more students than you think it's going to, not just our football students, right? It's going to actually help a lot more students. Um, and as far as the, the borough end of things, I mean, Never mind. I'm not going to say what I want to say. I'm going to behave. Well, I want to highlight Mr. Suter's comments, and just for anyone who's listening, this in no way, as Mr. Suter's mentioned, like this does not shut any doors. This does not say, this is not communicating to anybody that we do not want to continue with the relationship with the borough. We still need that relationship. We haven't, this is not making any, any, any motion or making any, uh, you know, sort of formal, like, whatever, right? That, you know, that, that relationship still exists. We, we still need it. Uh, we have ongoing negotiations to continue to play there. 
uh, and uh, and the board, in theory anyway, is, has has made a, um, uh, a kind of informal commitment to in investing um, some money uh, monies into the improvement of that facility as well um, to help us, you know, meet future needs. Um, so uh, yeah, we are not we are not quote unquote walking away from the park. Absolutely. At least not with this motion. Um, is there is there any more discussion on item five L? No. Can you clarify that though? Because I have been asked by community members what the plan is for for JV and varsity. Um, I, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there that deserves to have an answer to them. Uh, so that so they I, I don't have a definitive timeline. Uh, I think we can move. Um, most of our football games to the new facility. The new facility is going to take, I think, upwards of 18 months to build. Um, so it's, it's not going to be plopped down um, in one set piece. Um, so I think you're looking at 18 months there just for construction. Um, then considering what levels we can move to, to that facility, you know, if it's football. Um, you know, in that time, you know, it, I think that the difficulty is if our fundraising and, and grant work um, is aggressive and, and we get those funds, um, you know, to at least get lights um, in, in place, you know, we may be able to transition to, to it faster. So it's hard to put a, a solid timeline in. We, we know at least 18 months um, before we move anything to, to this facility. Um, you know, I would be hazarding a guess of, you know, one to three additional years, depending on what, how our fundraising goes, um, until we, we can potentially, if that's the direction we want to do, move varsity football there. You know, we, we need a facility that we can play at um, that meets all of our, our needs for varsity football. Um, that's going to require lights, bathrooms, probably an expanded um, bleacher system, uh, at least on the home side. Uh, to, as, as kind of the baseline for us to be able to play there. So, uh, you know, I, I'd be hazarding a guess. I would say 18 months to upwards to five years potentially. And, and the current plan to have a facility for varsity is to continue working with Memorial. Well, we, we don't have a ton of options at right. this point. Um, we have, I think there's also, again, this uh, – some some confusion out there because we've had proposals from you know from the university from Memorial as to what our pathway forward is for you know most of our home games. C correct. I, I mean, I think you know if if the board I think is a further discussion item is going to look at the agreement um, we've put forth with uh, put forth by the university. Um, currently, the schedules only match up for one varsity game potentially and one JV game at the university. Uh, you know, th that doesn't solve the, the, the bigger problem of where to put the other five and, and playoff games that we're used to playing. Um, you know, so the, right now, our option is Memorial Park for varsity football for the foreseeable future. Um, as soon as we are able to get the resources together to, to, to get that stadium on grounds uh, done, yeah, you know, we'll we'll look at making that transition. Thank you, uh, Bill. Just to be one clear, and I think it was uh, Mark from K and W said this to us. Eighteen months is eighteen months from the word go. Like tonight would be the word go because we're approving the, the start of permitting and all those things. C -c Correct. The clock just, does not start just, until this yeah. this all three of these items or well, two of these items are approved. Right. So it's not like it takes eighteen months to put a turf field down. It's just like the actual process of this starts all the paperwork side and all those things when you get into bidding. Permitting, permitting takes a, so, a long time. So, like, timeline of things, like 18 months. And, again, I think that they do that. I don't want to put pressure on them. They do that kind of conservatively. The goal for everybody, I think, would be we would love to have this for the fall of 24. We, we, we would. I've had a, a pretty big learning curve on how construction works and timelines that go along with it. So I, I, I think that's why they – are conservative. 
Any other discussion? All right, uh, can we have a roll call vote then on item 5M? Mr. Levi Kressler. Yes. Dr. Michael Lyman. Yes. Mr. Kurt Noggle. No. Mr. Fred no. Scott. Yes. Mr. Charlie Suters. Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Becky Wolfinger. Yes. Mr. Jim Bard. Yes. Mrs. Steph Aberly. Yes. Dr. Nathan Goats. Yes. Motion carried, eight yes, one no. All right, item 5N uh, is the Care Solace uh, Agreement, uh, Service Agreement. So, Shippensburg Area School District and Shippensburg Community Resource Coalition are partnering together to re, uh, regarding the rising behavioral and mental health needs within the district. SCRC applied for a grant, was rewarded monies to purchase Care Solace for uh, the district to utilize for the, in the 23 24 school year. Based on the results, school staff and Care Solace will link students to continued care and mental health supports. Administration recommends the approval of the attached care solace service agreement. Uh, just uh, one item, Dr. Support. Goats, if I could quickly. Care, these are two separate items. Uh, care solace is a community-wide service that we could post on our website that even community members could access um, and, and get connected to mental health services. Um, you know, the, care solace has value of itself because it is that concierge service for our families and our counselors and our students to be able to get access to mental health services. Um, all right, so uh, is there a motion to approve item 5N? So moved. Uh, motion made by Dr. Lyman, is there a second? Red Scott second. Uh, second by Mr. Scott, any discussion? So I just wanna re reiterate what uh, Mr. August just said that this this can be approved separate from Terrace Metrics, and it provides a service for our community to help our students get access to mental health services where available. Understanding that there is a shortage of mental health services uh, across the country right now, um, so however you feel about Terrace Metrics, this service would be valuable to the district. Can I get clarification? So the the Terrace Metrics is the actual survey, correct? That, that is the universal screener. <clears throat> Thank you. They, just again re to reiterate, the universal screener pairs well with Carcellus because then we have resources that we can connect families to. Um, again, all voluntary uh, and you know, and confidential. It's like the Walmart of mental health. Right, so you, you get connected to care, care Solace and then they connect you to stuff that you need. I, I know West Perry uses it. I was actually just at a conference with their assistant superintendent and she was speaking to me about how it's not just being utilized by students, but it's being utilized by community members as a whole. You know, she'll go and get her hair done and people will ask for that like contact information that have nothing to do with the school system, but they live in the community and they're getting services. <coughs> so essentially, we could post the website on our district homepage and the community members can either get the phone number or the email address if they need those services. Correct. And the counselors, social workers, other staff would be able to, if they see a kid or if they're working with a family, just hook them up with Care Solace. And the grant uh, for <laughs> use of the Care Solace service is for the upcoming school year. Um, is is this something that we can expect that the grant would be continued, uh, or the expectation is that if the district has a positive experience, then we would begin to pay for it after that year? So, so to answer that question, you know, we would certainly use this as a pilot period to determine the value and the return on investments um, and then come back before the board if those grant monies would disappear or, or can't be extended for, for some reason, yeah, you know, we would have another decision and, and at that point we would have some, some general data about, you know, without identifying individuals how much access, you know, have, has come through uh, our, our CareSolus portal. 
So at this point, we don't know if there's if the grant will continue or not. Or we we have a representative from Partnership for Better Health. We could have her come up and. Well, if she wouldn't mind, she to could that. answer some of these questions. That would be helpful. Yeah. Thank you. I was going to invite you to come up, but I couldn't see if you were still back there. And Thank you very much. Um, so uh, our partnership is fully dedicated to addressing the issues of youth mental health. Um, and uh, whenever we receive grant applications, pretty much it's a 95% approval rate. Um, so I can't give a guarantee, but this is a priority of ours. Um, and. Um, already had discussions with the SCRC about planning for their next grant application. Okay. So it's a pretty safe bet. Okay. 95% is a pretty safe bet. Yeah. We can yeah. get out of it anytime we want, right? We can get out of it anytime we want, right? Yeah, but, yeah. Right, Doc? So, so. I, I would assume so. <laughs> can you, no money. if for some reason the board, you know, we started it and, yeah. you know, we, we, would we be able to withdraw? We are not the federal or state government. We are a very flexible funder, okay. um, and we work with grantees when there's any type of delay or change in approach. Thank you. You're welcome. I don't have any questions, but I have some comments I wrote down. Um, so I just want to, first of all, thank all of the students and anyone that has kind of come and spoke about the subject, no matter how you feel about the subject. Um, my vote in the way I'll be voting does not mean I'm not concerned. I, I want people to really have an understanding of that. Um, me personally, I would love to form an ad hoc committee between the board, the district professionals, and the community. I think having some kind of partnership like that could be valuable. Um, I think we all recognize that there's a need for mental health solutions, but I think we need to analyze what resources that we already have in-house that are not being maximized to drive results for our kids, but that are costing us financially. Um, I also believe in inviting parents into this conversation, and I think it's essential. Um, how many parents out there in our district don't know what the warning signs of a nine-year-old contemplating suicide are? And for anyone that thinks that a nine-year-old does not contemplate suicide, they absolutely do. How many parents don't know what to look for? With kids with anorexia, bulimia, cutting. How many parents don't know what resources that we have available for them already? How about we invite parents to the table uh, to start the conversation and to educate them with the talent that we have and are already paying for? If we want to affect change with mental health, parents have a responsibility and the most critical role to play and we should be a supporting partner who provides resources and information. I guess for, for me, the program mental health is if I thought every parent would be involved and do what was right for their child, I'd probably, the system wouldn't be not, it wouldn't be necessary. But I was a police officer for 46 years I went to these houses where kids are sitting there and their parents are worrying about getting packs of cigarettes rather than worrying about if they're going to be eating. Where parents were more worried about their bills and going out all the night rather than worrying about that child got the mental health or whatever, what else they need. It's nice to say that it's good for parents, but all parents aren't good parents. And unfortunately in my career I got to see the ones that weren't. And I want every, every, every possible avenue available for the child. I don't care about the parent. I want the child. And if you can pick out one child that needs help with this system, I'm voting for it. Any other discussion on item 5N? All right, can we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Lentz? Dr. Michael Lyman. Yes. Mr. Kurt Noggle. No. Mr. Fred Scott. Yes. Mr. Charlie Suters. No. Mrs. Becky Wolfinger. No. Mr. Jim Bard. No. Mr. Levi Kressler. Yes. Mrs. Steph Aberley. Yes. Dr. Nathan Goats. Yes. Five yes, motion carried. All right, that brings us to item 5-0. 
Terrace Metrics Agreement, Shippensburg Area School District and the SR, SCRC are partnering together to measure and monitor the rising behavioral and mental health needs within the district. Um, SCRC applied for a grant, was rewarded monies to purchase Terrace Metrics to utilize in the 23-24 school year. Terrace Metrics is the program that will measure and monitor the mental health through a universal mental health screener. For the first year, students in grades four, seven, and nine will participate, or parents, guardians can choose to opt out. Based on the results, school staff, and if board approved, Care Solace will link students to continued care and mental health supports. That administration recommends the approval of the attached terrorist metrics agreement. Um, before we have discussion on this, uh, Mr. August, could you clarify the process for the opt out, how that would work? So we will communicate numerous opportunities um, over the summer and before we uh, put this survey out, um, you know, using robocalls um, and emails and on our website, uh, we will make it uh, patently obvious how to opt, opt out. Um, and it won't be just a single uh, single communication. I have a question. Can before uh, uh, Dr. Before Gutzel, we sorry. have the discussion, yeah. Um, thanks. All right. <laughs> Do we have a motion <laughs> to approve item five O? So moved. Motion made by Dr. Lyman. Is there a second? Fred Scott seconds. Mr. Scott second. Mr. Kressler. <clears throat> the communication. Um, I was a firm, firm believer of the opt-in rather than opt-out. As a parent myself, I would opt my kids out. I don't have 46 years of experience working with, with troubled people in the community like Mr. Scott does, but I've got 14 years of them working with kids who come from really, really bad backgrounds. And my professional, <coughs> like, I'm not an expert in this, but I see what kids, like there's really issues that kids have right here in our communities. And the, the opt-in, opt-out thing, I was like, hey, opt-out, I just, we have to opt-in. I think the problem with that is, if you say opt-in, I'm going to check my kids' stuff every day, so I know that I'm going to opt-in, or I'm going to, I would do that. It's those, ki those kids who don't have that at home, that they don't have that, that stability or whatever the case may be, that they may not, they just kind of keep falling through the cracks, and they're out there. And I hate it that they're out there, but they're out there. So I guess in terms of the opt out, my, my question is when we say opt out and we get a form, a paper, whatever the case may be, that says that it's parent, it goes home and parents acknowledge that they were even given that. And, and it seems a little bit like I'm trying to find a happy medium with everybody because that's been one of the things we've talked about. We talked about it six months ago. We're still talking about it now. That it's like, hey, if that goes out, then a parent's got to acknowledge that they've been told about this, and then there's going to be something coming in the, in the fall in the next school year. So, so the way I think that could work would be with our beginning of the year paperwork. So, so we wouldn't be doing this on day one. Right. Um, we would be, you know, we send home that packet of information you get at the start of every year. You know, we certainly can include that form, and, and we generally have a sign off from parents that they receive those forms. I, I would, that would just make me feel more comfortable with this. A absolutely, yeah. You know, the, the, the goal is not, you know, the goal is to be transparent. The goal is to, to you know, honor the wishes of parents. Um, you know, it's not, it's not intended to be a, a forced upon. Um, the, opt, the opt out is because this is a universal screener. So when, you, know, you may recall from my presentation, you know, th this, is the, this is the screener we use just like we use for reading, just like we use for math, just like we use for, um, you know, behaviors. Um, and so, you know, we, we have to know where those, those uh, you know, where those trouble spots are and who needs help. And we screen for other medical issues as well, right? Don't we, we screen for nope. no, sorry. scoliosis and I don't know. I mean, mental health is health uh, and, uh, and, and screening works. Any other comments on item 5.0? I think it would just, um, if you haven't, to read uh, some of the uh, the email that was shared to us by the, ga the guidance counselor um, and some of the concerns that they have. So if you were on the fence, um, they also have some reservations uh, regarding this. So I think to take that into mind before you vote to opt in um, and what this would do to our staff and uh, their thoughts on implementing this. 
Any other comments? Um, I have one. Um, <clears throat> just, uh, I would, this is a pilot program. And I've spent most of the last day and most of the last weekend talking to SCRC, talking to Partnership for Better Health, um, talking to a bunch of you board members. Um, I would really like to see this pass. And I'm willing to compromise on some of the logistics of how it is currently designed in an effort to have this pilot actually go forward. And if that means we have to change it to an opt-in format in order for it to pass, I think I'm willing to make that compromise so that we can at least let this pilot go forward. And if we don't like it, we don't do it again. If we like it, we do it again. Um, but if, if that's what it takes to get five votes tonight, to get something on the ground so that we can do something, this is free money from the Partnership for Better, better, health, better health. I don't think any of us wants to say to our district that we are voting against helping kids with mental health issues. Um, and so I'm willing to make that compromise. I'm willing to amend my motion in order to make it an opt-in program so that we can get something um, happening in the district. Is, uh, is, is there not a way for us to do this in-house? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, it, you, we need a universal screener. I mean, so, so it really comes down to your tier two approach to mental health, um, just like we have a tier two approach to, like I said, reading. Um, so most of these, th there are other there are other survey slash screeners um, outside of Terrace Metrics. Um, yeah, there's there's another one called Rhythm, but at the end of the day, they all serve the same function. They're they're asking students how their mental health is, um, you know, in a, in a variety of different, uh, you know, a variety of different categories. Um, so at the end of the day, it's getting that information and getting seeing who's red flagged so that we can get them support and, and perhaps get them connected to Care Solace uh, so that their their family can can give them the support as well. But I'm saying there, there's not a tool that we already pay for in the district as far as um, surveying goes that we can't use. I mean, I... I'm, I'm not familiar with one that would do the clinical side of this that's been vetted. Um, Lauren, do you, do you, are you aware of any? But I mean, if, if the goal is to find out how the kids are feeling, right, and you ask them a series of the same questions that this outside company is asking, you're going to get that data returned to you. I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, Ms. Wilming. Is, is your concern that the data is going someplace else and it's not? Just no, it's, it's not even about the data. It, it's about the concern that we, it, I think that we have a way in the district that we could do it. Um, I mean, there's a gazillion, you know, resources that we have. I mean, when you look at uh, the thought exchange and those kind of, you know, the, the programs that we already are utilizing that gives you return information backwards. So, so something like thought exchange would not allow us to, to get to individual kids. It would give us a more holistic approach. Youth True Survey that, that we are be putting out in May would touch on these subjects, but but more specifically to a building, similar to the way the pay surveys does. So the pay survey gives us this information, but it doesn't pinpoint who we have to get to to provide additional supports. So I would be skeptical of, of something we would create. We, we don't have the expertise to design a survey um, with you know validity and, and reliability um, to even ask the right questions. You know, so. It's not something I would be comfortable in-house creating. Um, you know, I, I would turn it over to mental health professionals um, to create those tools for us. I, I think that would also, to Ms. Eberle's concern, that would put additional burdens on our counselors if we're and other staff if we're saying you need to design a, a system to do this screening. Um, where if, because. I understand the hesitation. I understand that there is some hesitation from some of the staff in the district about this. But um, the other benefit, if we do this compromise of going opt in, is that that there will be fewer students participating. Unfortunately, it's not ideal for me, 
but there will be fewer students and we will be missing some of the people that uh, Mr. Kressler and Mr. Scott have been talking about. But because there are fewer students, that would also mean less work for the counselors. Um, so to me, this, this compromise of going to opt in sort of meets all of the um, objections that people have, maybe not all of them, but a lot of the objections that people have had about this program while still letting us do s this pilot. And, and find out something. As the public, how would the parents know what questions they're going to be asked at the first? You need to learn how basic board meetings work. You have to adjust the education you want to answer questions. I'd like to make a motion to call the question. Well, okay, so um, Dr. Lyman, you wanted to uh, amend your motion. Um, to uh, so rather than uh, it reading opt out would read opt in. So uh, to be clear, for the first year, students in grades four, seven, and nine would participate, or parents and guardians can choose to opt in. Um, well, I guess we need to rephrase that then. For the first year, students in grades four, seven, and nine could participate if their parents and guardians choose to opt in. Is that correct? Correct. Mr. Scott, uh, you seconded the motion. Are you comfortable with that revised I language? I am. All right. Uh, any further discussion then? All right then. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Kurt Noggle. No. Mr. Fred Scott. Yes. Mr. Charlie Suters. No. Mrs. Becky Wolfinger. No. Mr. Jim Bard. No. Mr. Levi Kressler. Yes. Dr. Michael Lyman. Yes. Mrs. Steph Aberley. No. Dr. Nathan Goats. Yes. Four no, five yes. Or I mean, sorry, four yes, five no, motion failed. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, that brings us to the discussion agenda. So these items uh, should appear on the uh, action agenda next meeting. Um, so item 6A is the district camera project. Administration recommends approving si uh, Siemens to install cameras, uh, network video recorders, et cetera. Um, the quote, I believe, is attached. It's not attached. So we don't actually have the quotes. This is more of a placeholder, and we're still waiting for additional bids, Dr. Goats. All right, but the entire school district camera project would not exceed 30. Okay, so we were waiting. I, um, so help me out then, because we, so, this was on hold because we were waiting for other. Co correct. We're, we're waiting for uh, another firm. They're coming in through a, yet another walkthrough. Um, we've given them parameters that fit that budget number to, to see what they can provide district-wide. Um, and then we'll put the we'll put the best of those forward to the board. All right. So we'll expect consider. a final recommendation in the next yeah. meeting then. Correct. All right. Well, uh, I don't want to promise that. <laughs> they're they're not great about coming and <laughs> it it's a long process to get them out here and get the right. quotes. Any discussion on that? Uh, item six B, uh, new debt maximum parameters resolution. The administration recommends approval to adopt the attached maximum parameters resolution authorizing the district to borrow for the following ship taking shape step two projects. Um, and that includes the items listed as related to the projects that we've approved design work for. Any discussion there? All right, item 6C, uh, change in support staff status. Administration recommends the approval of the following change in hours. Part-time classroom assistant working 5.75 hours um, to a full-time classroom assistant working seven hours per day. Any discussion there? Item 6D, creation of district registrar position. So the district uh, administration is recommending um, that the board uh, approve removing the district registrar responsibilities from the district receptionist business office assistant position and creating a new school year uh, part-time district registrar position, and a part-time summer district registrar. Any questions about that? Uh, item 6E, 
uh, district solicitor, this is renewal of our, I don't know if we call it a contract, but uh, it, um, stock, or, um, Christopher Harris uh, at Stock and Leader as our district solicitor. Any discussion there? Item 6F, uh, G-Blues Summer Zone Camp. Administration recommends approval of the G-Blues Summer Zone Camp, a yearly camp held on the campus of Shippensburg University that is open to all district students in grades one through five. Any questions? Item 6G uh, is the agreement with government software services. Administration will recommend the approval of the attached agreement with government software services to print and mail the district's real estate property and per capita tax bills in preparation for the duplicates for the, for the next year. Um, is this a renewal agreement? That is correct. Okay. Any questions about that? Uh, item 6H is agreement with uh, um, Caillou? How we say it? CIU. <laughs> Capital Area Intermediate Unit. Uh, English language development and English as a second language services. Uh, so this is an agreement with the Capital Area Intermediate Unit for <coughs> EL, ESL and ELD services. Any questions there? I just want to make a quick comment on that. You'll see in the budget that Christy presented, I'm requesting another full-time ESL teacher to be a district teacher. This position is to give us flexibility. Um, speaking with our community, it seems like we're going to be getting more ESL students coming in for next year. But with the ESL population, they can be transient. So I know that having three full-time staffers will be able to fulfill that for years to come. I'm not comfortable making that fourth full-time staff commitment for you know the foreseeable future, just knowing that the population can be transient. So I wanted to keep that flexibility with contracting with the IU for another year rather than bringing all of our ESL teachers in-house, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Thank you. All right, item 5I, L&L party rentals contract. Uh, this is for the Seychelles uh, School Field Day on May 30th. Any questions there? Item 6J, proposed revisions to the Shippensburg uh, Soccer Booster Club bylaws. Any questions there? Item 6K, school stream renewal contract. Uh, renewal subscription to the school stream um, beginning September 15th. Cost of a little over eight thousand dollars. Any questions? Item six L operations and maintenance agreements. Administration recommends approval of the following renewal service agreements: Modern Fold three-year renewal agreement, Berkshire Systems Group three-year renewal agreement for inspecting, testing, maintenance of fire alarm systems, Johnson Controls five-year renewal agreement for the fire alarm system at the Intermediate School Eastern Time Incorporated five-year renewal agreement for fire alarm monitoring and velocity EHS uh, three-year service contract for to provide the mandatory tracking, updating, and public accessibility of our material safety data sheets for chemicals, and then ASH Enterprises two-year renewal agreement um, to conduct annual preventative maintenance to the high school planetarium. Any questions on any of that? Uh, item 6M, uh, these are change orders. The East Coast Contracting Administration recommends the approval of the following change orders for the middle school additions. Questions? Item 6N, uh, Shippensburg University Field Usage Agreement. Administration recommends the approval of the attached field use agreement with Shippensburg University for the district to be able to play one JV football game as a kind of dress rehearsal, and then uh, one varsity football game at Seth Grove Stadium on the campus of the university. Agreement cost sheets are attached. Any comments, discussion, questions? Item 60, senior high school uh, back entrance sculpture. Administration recommends approval of the preliminary concept drawings fee from sculptor Steve Dolben. Uh, to design a sculpture for the back entrance of the senior high school. Um, Mr. Dolben is the sculptor who designed the Greyhound that is currently at the front of the building. The cost for the design drawing fee is $100 and will be paid by the class of 2023. Any questions? Comments there? I have no question about that. But uh, did, did, we, did 
we come into agreement on the, the design for the basketball floor? We, we did. <laughs> uh, so uh, the the design of the Greyhound. Um, with the doggy in the middle. The dog, yeah. yeah. That, that was the winner um, of the student vote, um, two to one. Uh, 321 students voted. Um, 200 plus voted for that one. Okay. Uh, so it's that personally, I think they made the right choice. So, yeah. So we, so yep. I, it yeah, it should be moving forward. Um, you know, we're looking to install that on the 13th through the 30th. Thank you. All right. We've reached uh, our second citizens' comment period. This is for citizen comments regarding non-agenda items. Um. I believe we have a couple of people that may want to comment on non-agenda items. Um, please uh, identify yourself by name. Let us know if you are a member or if you live within the district or not. Um, and please address all comments to the board as a whole. Make sure they're in the form of the statement. Questions will be taken under advisement. Um, responses to questions will be offered by the superintendent. Uh, you have three minutes um, to make your comments. Uh, comments relative to private student matters or personnel issues should be directed to the appropriate school authority outside of this meeting. Um, I think, let's see, Darren, did you want to comment on a... I don't know. Okay, well, you were my only... Oh, wait a second. John uh, Stout? He's gone. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Stout. I live in the Shippensburg Township on Pin Oak Lane. I'm here as president of the Shippensburg Basketball Booster Club. And I'd like to share some details about an individual who's dedicated much of his life to preparing and guiding the students of this school district. This individual served as the volunteer public address announcer at various high school sporting events for 35 years. He dedicated 35 years of his life to serving as an educator within this district. Additionally, he's known within the Shippensburg community simply as coach due to serving that role in the Greyhounds basketball program for 35 years. A few short years ago, Coach Ray Staver reached a milestone, career win number 400 with the Greyhounds. At that time, Andy Enfield was interviewed and asked to share his perspective of Coach Staver. And he's a former Greyhound student athlete who played for Coach Daver in the mid-1980s. He's probably Shippensburg's most famous alum and currently the head basketball coach at the University of Southern California. And he acknowledged Coach Daver by saying, quote, he had a positive influence in my life on many high school players on and off the court. When you start to look outside your immediate family, it's important to have people you can learn from and be a positive influence in your life. Coach Staver was a huge influence on my life, as well as my teammates, end quote. Greg Van Syok, a 2008 Greyhound grad, set a couple of basketball records before going on to study and play basketball at Shippensburg University. Today, Craig would tell you that, quote, preparation was definitely one of the things that I remember. Whether we were playing the best team or the worst team, the preparation the coach put into each game was always 100%, end quote. More recently, another outstanding student athlete, Jeremy Thomas, who is currently a student at the California University of Pennsylvania, says, quote, Coach Staver was nothing but a great coach, leader, and mentor for me and countless student athletes that have come through Shippensburg. The morals and values that he taught are something that get carried through life and are critical in terms of keys to success. Coach taught valuable life lessons, spent countless hours at year-round open gyms, summer league games, youth summer camps, and was always in attendance and showed an interest in elementary school and middle school games. Much like has been done in some neighboring school districts, the Booster Club proposes naming the basketball floor Coach Daver Court. Boiling Springs High, St. Maria Goretti High, and Carlisle High have all named their gym or gym floor after a former coach. If you're looking for stats or numbers of wins, those three neighboring coaches averaged 482 wins over their career. Coach Staver has 445 to his credit. What's more important than wins is what he's done for this town, for the school district, for his students, and for his student athletes. I anticipate an additional cost to add a text, something similar to Coach Staver Court uh, graphic to the floor to be less than $1,000 if done in coordination with the upcoming project. 
If approved, the Booster Club will gladly fund additional fee and fundraise to recoup the money spent. Please accept my humble thank you for considering this proposal. So, uh, Mr. Stout, there is actually a formal um, paperwork under the board docs for kind of naming rights. Um, there's a whole process dedicated just to that, so it's not just a matter of bringing it to the board. It's a matter of filling out um, that paperwork and submitting it. Um, it's a process done outside of the board, so yes. that's something that I would do? Yep. Okay. Right, where could I find that? Um, if you go to uh, the, the district website under our district, then you'll click on school board down to board policies, and then it would be under the Come 700th. On, <laughs> um, I can forward you um, that link, but it is on uh, in the board policy. You think of it, sure. So, sure. what do I need to do then to kick that off? Just complete this form, send it to. Yeah. You can just drop it off to the district mm -hmm. office. We can. Okay. Follow that policy through. We'll do. Okay. All right. Thank you. If you and if you need help, just call up to the district <coughs> office. We'll do. get you what you need. All right. Thank you. Government agencies, we specialize in bureaucracy. <laughs> um, thank you, though, for that presentation. Appreciate it. Uh, Jeremy, you have another comment? Sure do. Uh, first off, I think that we missed a great opportunity this evening to thank the wonderful children that showed up in support of what they believe in. Uh, last week, the children that showed up also got thanked and recognized. The children that showed up today in numbers got no recognition from you or you. So on that behalf, I would like to thank all of the student athletes that showed up today in support of what they believe in with their coach as a group and as a team. And I thank you very much for your support in getting this stadium started. And I know the children of this community do also. Thank you. I think that support was shown during board comments last time. We hadn't got there yet. Um, so, you know, you're, you did. So, so, I mean, we're, we're getting there and always appreciate the students that come and speak at board meetings. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to, oh, or a couple more? So, Mr. Stout, that is actually policy 701.1. <laughs> I knew it was the 700s. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Good evening, um, Amanda McNair. I live in District A. Um, first, I want to thank you all for your time. I know you guys have really hard jobs and decisions to make, and I know many of you have been putting a lot of time and effort into it. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but as I was listening to everything, my memory was jogged about the meeting two weeks ago, and something was brought up, and I don't want it to get missed and forgotten about, the looking into how much time my kids are spending on the electronics, what they're doing on the school laptops. I promise you I'm dealing with an issue now, and it stems from this. Not just the school one, the home ones too, but I've had to take home ones from someone who's much older in the school, who I shouldn't have to, but I still have to let him have his school laptop to get his work done. I can't control what he's doing. He can. I mean, frankly, I don't know what he's doing watching YouTube videos for a class when I don't want him on YouTube. I think there's a lot of things we need to do to help our kids, and that's one of them. There's many other things. Our little ones, including the pre-K programs you have, get our kids outside. I beg you to find a way to get our kids outside. There's a huge difference in a kid that has access to running around and learning how to be mobile, learning how to use their body differently. It helps their mental function. If they're sitting inside, they're, they're not made to sit all day. They're not made to sit for hours upon hours. That contributes to some of the issues that we have. People think that they have ADHD, ADD. Some of them do. Some of them have legitimate issues. But some of them just need a way to release their energy. We're energetic beings. You can. Challenge all you want, but there's so many studies out there. We're energetic beings. We need a way to transfer the energy. We need to be in contact with the ground. We need to balance those electrons. It's scientific. 
So I challenge you, find ways to help our kids that's not just parents monitor the electronics and monitor like this. I know we have all kinds of issues, but we have to find the ways to help them. I thank you for your time and have a great night. Thank you. <coughs> yes. I'm Barbara Dickey and I live in uh, uh, level A. Um, thank you for moving to the library. This is much more, uh, much more user friendly, much more community friendly. I will say that I was uh, uh, approached the board a year ago and I did not feel the sense that you were listening to us as much as I do this evening, so I thank you for that. Um, I've been dealing a lot with porn, kid, kitty porn, you name it. And what I'm hearing students uh, throughout Franklin and Cumberland County telling me, they're figuring out how to find it in the schools, and it's throughout the schools. So I encourage you to look at that. I'm, I'm dealing with so many people that started with porn, uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, then some kitty porn landed in their lap. And as they face court and they face Meg Megan's list, they face all kinds of stuff. My heart hurts. My heart hurts for, for where students get this at such a young age. And so I encourage you uh, with what Amanda had suggested, any way that we can make sure that the pornography piece, and you look at most serial killers, you look at most situations, many of them started with porn. So that, that's a real big issue. But I do appreciate all your time, and thank you so much. All right, any other comments? All right, thank you. Um, all right, it's time for board comments. Mr. Suters? I'm good. Dr. Lyman? Puffs was amazing. It was the play. It was great. I heard it was really good. <coughs> it was. I wish I could have gone. Especially Voldemort. <laughs> <laughs> I hear Voldemort had a nice talk with the superintendent one of the nights. She made me part of the show when I did not yeah. ask to be part of, but it was great. Yeah, I heard <laughs> she it was did. Great. She was fantastic. <laughs> the whole show was great. Mr. Scott? Uh, Stephanie, <coughs> I am amazed at you knowledge of the policies of this school district. <laughs> My God, I, I read them, and not to the extent you do, but I, I commend you on, on the work you put into policies with the school district, because nothing comes up with a policy that you don't know. <laughs> Mrs. Wolfinger? I second that. <laughs> No, um, thank you again to all of you know the students that took their time, um, both from the athletics, but also the other students that spoke about mental health. Um, and I'm just gonna, you know, I'm not gonna repeat what I said earlier, but we do have to find solutions. Um, I believe that there's solutions that we have within our district that we just haven't tapped into. Um, and I would be the first one on an ad hoc committee committee if we formed it, because I do think it's absolutely critical that we work together to solve the problem between the community, um, you know, in particular the parents, because we have the most important role to play in addressing this issue. Um, but I definitely, uh, you know, would be a volunteer. I volunteer as tribute. Mr. Kressler. Um, so a couple of things. First, let me start by saying the girls track and field team has won at least a share of the league title. They're seven and zero right now. They're six and zero in their conference. They have won, they will win outright. With the win versus James Buchanan this week, I'm not sure if that's tomorrow, Wednesday, or Thursday, but they have next another week. next week. If they win next week, that will be the outright champions. Then, uh, Erica Buheister, I apologize if I messed your name up. She set the school record in the pole vault recently. Uh, the four by 100 team also broke the school record. Alyssa Turn was third in the high jump at the Jack Roddick Invitational this past weekend at the university, and Jillian Sidnor won the 400 meter at the Jack Roddick Invitational Saturday. Uh, Softball, what I, what I found, they went one and one with possibly a third game that I couldn't find a result for. They're eight and four in the season, returning to action tomorrow. Baseball had a tough week. All that said, they're going to get back to their winning ways tomorrow against West Perry. And then finally, um, I guess with what Mr. Stout uh, that just came up and spoke, um, I'm sure he's going to get that form if there's a, the form is in the policy on my thing. I don't see it as an attachment on my phone, but. Um, when he gets that in, I did see where it says that there will be that there's to be an ad hoc committee, including the superintendent, business manager, at least one board member, and a community member. Um, 
I think that's something, given the timeline maybe of the booster clubs willing or whatever their, their willingness for this or their, um, their want for that with the timeline that we're doing the gym floor, I think this is something that we should really strongly consider um, at least looking into. Um, so I'm sure if the, that paper, he'll get that stuff filled out, I'm sure, um, quickly because he seems interested because he gave us a great picture and um, put a lot of effort into it. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Mr. Stout, for this and the Booster Club for that. That's all. Mr. Bard. Uh, I'm just glad that uh, we got the stadium going there. It's not really, I'd like to see some lights and more seating so we could hold graduation out there, maybe. But other than that, I'm good. Mr. Noggle. Yep, good. Mrs. Everly. Just really um, looking forward to the momentum that we've been making recently. Um, small victories and let's keep it going. Uh, I agree with that. I'm, again, I express my excitement about the athletic facility. I'm also, again, I once again express um, my, uh, you know, hope that we continue to work uh, with the borough and the and the parks authority um, to, um, you know, improve uh, Memorial Stadiums because we we need it and 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 we'll need to continue to use it even after we have our our uh, upgraded athletic facility. And uh, one sport that doesn't get mentioned a lot, but probably the sport that is going to benefit the most from having um, artificial turf field is our field hockey team. And I'm just really excited um, for our field hockey team to have uh, an athletic or uh, an artificial turf field to, to play on. Um, also, just want to wish the students good luck with PSSAs this week. I believe they start tomorrow. Yes, mm -hmm. sir. Uh, so good luck uh, to all of our students uh, with um, their PSSAs. All right, that brings us to information date servers, date savers, sorry. Uh, April 25th, the Community Outreach Committee meeting is at 6 p.m. Uh, right here. Uh, April 27th, Transportation Committee meeting, 4 p.m. at the conference room at the administration building. Uh, May 1st, again, a week from today, is a Budget and Finance Committee meeting, 7 p.m. here uh, in the high school library. Uh, May 3rd, Policy Committee meeting, 4 p.m. at the conference room at the administration building. Uh, May 6th uh, is Sasha's prom at Bicycle Company in Shippensburg at 7 p.m. Uh, and then we do not have on here our next board meeting, but I believe that's May 8th. Correct. Um, and I'm just going to go to that point. So uh, our next board meeting, May 8th, um, with uh, Committee of the Whole starting at 7 and the board meeting starting at 8 o'clock. All right. Is, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Let's go make a motion to adjourn. Wait a second. That's Mr. Suter's job. No, no, no. He, <laughs> he takes too long. They would change the